welcome everybody to session three of our um, webinar series on the fish more trade um, globally. Um, we've had a couple of really good days with some fantastic presentations from people from around the world looking at um, different aspects of the trade ranging from some of the fishery issues to trade flows. Um, just bear with me for, for a second. Um, sorry. Yes, yesterday we had um, four presentations, sorry, five presentations. Um, there was an overview from Professor Yvonne Sadovi from Hong Kong University looking at the, the usages, the destination and trends in the fish more trade globally. Um, Stan Shea from Bloom in Hong Kong dug into the detail of trade flows in and out of Hong Kong and looked at the, the um, shark fin trade as a potential um, analogue to the trade in, in fish moors. Um, Dr. Akhilesh from CFMRI in India um, looked at the situation in, in India, both in terms of the trade. He noted that the, the trade in fish moor in Asia um, is many centuries old. Um, by, by Ann, um, who's a PhD student at Hong Kong University, um, spoke about some of the work that he's been doing using DNA to look at, um, to identify the fish moors which can be purchased in, in China. And finally, Michael Grant from James Cook University in North Queensland uh, went through the work that he's been doing with colleagues in Papua New Guinea, and in particular, the interactions um, with threatened species of sharks, including sawfishes, river sharks, and then also um, marine mammals such as the such as dolphins. Um, today we're going to be focusing on um, the management side of things. Um, so today we'll be hearing from Kim Friedman from FIO, uh, from myself about um, some of the management issues, particularly in in tropical countries and Asia. Uh, then Dr. Julian Hughes from the Department of Primary Industries here in um, Australia is going to look at some of the specific challenges of, of managing a um, uh, one of the cyanids given its um, um, take in a number of fisheries. Um, Michael Fabigny um, is going to, um, he has a pre-record, but looking at some of the issues of um, dealing with high value species in low income contexts. And we heard a little bit about this yesterday from, um, from Michael, uh, sorry, um, sorry, yeah, from Michael Grant. Um, and then finally, um, Tony Nilovic, who's based in French Guiana, um, is going to be looking at the specific situation of one of the threatened species of cyanids in, um, in that part of the world. So as with the last couple of days, 20 minute presentations, five minutes for questions, um, after the first um, three sessions um, today, we'll have a quick tea break. Um, and then also, uh, so I forgot to mention, we also have a presentation from Ken Yohanji from um, PEMSI. Um, so, and then after the, the, the third group of presentations, sorry, the second group of three presentations, we'll have a final discussion before wrap up. Um, so, Kim, happy to hand over to you um, and you can begin your presentation. Good morning, everyone, and thanks very much. I'm gonna start sharing my screen. Uh, my talk is uh, a focus really on the international levers that we can toggle to focus our conservation interests for uh, aquatic species. So a little bit different to some of the others, not purely focused on fish more, but uh, some of the same kind of questions that we'll be dealing with. Okay, we read daily that the ocean is in dire straits. Uh, it's alarming media, the messages out there are largely shining a light on uh, ocean collapse. But uh, I want to give you a little bit of a view of my perspective. Um, I was born in South Africa and spent the first couple of dozen years growing up around the Atlantic and o Indian Oceans. And then a dozen years schooling in England, Scotland, and Wales before moving to fisheries and environment authorities for another dozen in Australia. I'm starting to sound old, aren't I? Um, then another dozen working across 23 Pacific Island states and territories. And most recently, 
seven and a half years working out of FAO's head office here in, uh, in Rome, which takes me through this subject matter of international levers that we can pull. Um, <clears throat> why is this important? Well, it's important because I've seen firsthand our public interest in community good results in how governments prioritize their expenditure on, on what the public wants. Basically the way funds are spent to fuel the delivery of actions. Funds shown here in this highly simplified figure are typically channeled from the community through two main government offices. In the case of fish, this equates to investment in national resource management agencies like national fisheries departments and biodiversity conservation agencies like national environment departments. The goals of fisheries and these environment department ministries or whatever they are have common aspirations, but one is largely focused on ensuring long-term returns while the other is focused on ensuring production of these, uh, sorry, a protection of these wild species. And both of these are very legitimate for keeping the community happy. Uh, as mentioned before, they have common aspirations, but their work can on occasion become isolated. And this, you know, gives you an idea of, of the areas they're working in, either when the abundance is high and there's no range loss, or you're starting to get to places where there's few remains and there is range loss. Note the different groups use different guidance and often attend as part of country delegation different working groups and multilateral, multilateral agreements, be they fishery focused or focused on delivery of outcomes to the environment. What the community wants is that when a fish numbers dwindle, their spawning potential is impacted and their range restricted, that biodiversity conservation practitioners should be enabled to use their tools for providing greater protection. And equally, when fisheries communities are working to optimize catches, even when catches are fluctuating, this should be where the capacity is enabled, giving each agency the resources they need to the jobs they need to do. The question here is, are we getting the balance right? In financing the delivery of functions of each, there needs to be a natural articulation in the roles between those man managing fish stocks and those protecting fish. Think of a healthy knee joint. We need a healthy articulation that each can work on their tasks for the benefit of all in the community. The question we face through our governments is how to cut the pie of available resources to ensure there's capacity and delivery of support and control functions of each practice. Okay, let's consider the global levers we have available, think policies, definitions, and rules that guide fisheries. The law of the sea presents a legal framework for all marine activity. In regards to fish resources, it requires states to maintain or restore populations of harvested species at levels which can produce the maximum sustainable yield. Also, they must ensure not to endanger living resources through overexploitation and also to take consideration of the effects on species associated with or dependent upon harvested species so their reproduction is not seriously threatened. In other words, fish to maximum sustainable yield, but don't impose lasting damage and depletion on fish stocks and their environment. Within the SDGs, consider SDG 14, a global commitment to maintain fish stocks at or above MSY. Note too that SDG 14 remains the least funded SDG of all, receiving only 0.1% of development final, where it represents about 99% of the living planet's space. Then further down the line, consider FAO the specialized agency of the UN with technical capacity and a mandate to address global fisheries, agriculture, uh, fisheries and agriculture issues and its vision for blue transformation. And this outlines its approaches and investments in fisheries management. All of these are levers that we can use internationally to point the investment in the right direction for community good. So here there's an opportunity to set up process to ensure visibility of certain stocks of interests, maybe fish more. For example, stocks that yield more fish, more within fisheries index of sustainability, consider the political will this will bring investments. In other words, if we get these stocks within the indexes that is used to measure those international commitments, we have more focus on them, there's more political will to make sure they get looked after. Let's just have a quick dive into fish stocks and fish sites. I won't go deep here. Fisheries is required to maintain the resilience of stocks 
and their enabling system and uh, consider and they need to consider all stocks fish beyond their maximum sustainable yield as non-compliant or overfished. The Kobe plot on the left of fish stock status in the USA shows, USA shows shifts, shifts in the amount of stock and levels of fishing through time. There's almost a never ending number of tools and approaches that are used to manage fisheries, but how many of these are being employed and how well they're being employed on the stocks that, and and how well they might be employed on stocks that are yielding more, there's many questions on, on whether these are getting enough attention in the overall world that we do fisheries management on. We can, we can change that if needed to get the fisheries lever compressed to bring greater focus to the species that we have of interest in this tool. Okay, switching here. Now with one foot in fisheries and one foot in the global conservation initiative, consider global commitments linked to global reporting on agreed deliverables for fisheries under the CBD, the Convention on Biological Diversity. This is their previous strategic plan where they articulate the key things that the community expects of fisheries. And if you go through these, these are IHE target six, you see a quite a clear vision for what fisheries has to report on and deliver on. I won't go through them, each of them, but because I want to dive now into what guides biodiversity conservation in the international arena. So we step over to global efforts for delivery of biodiversity conservation. Here on the top left, we can consider, um, top left, I mean that little triangle where we're moving away from abundant to things that are getting lost, uh, ranges are being lost, uh, abundance are going down. Let's consider the global, co definitions, rules and criteria that guide policies across biodiversity conservation community. Overarching among these, directives and guidance and goals and targets of newly established Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. This articulates a range of goals and targets, including for fisheries, although fisheries is not well represented or articulated in one standalone target. But there are indicators for target four on species recovery in the framework might be quite well focused to the kinds of jobs we've got to do with some fish more stocks. And in many places, uh, they adopt the IUCN red list methods to characterize what is threat. And further in the realm of conservation are trade controls under CITES, who, whose provisions can either prohibit or place controls on trade for species added to its appendix. So let's move on a little bit. We won't, we'll come back to CITES in a minute. And just talk about uh, IUCN characterization of extinction risk or threat. Uh, what is threatened as formulated by IUCN? And how do conventions like CITES and off, that often can follow threatened characterize, these threatened characterizations set up to protect certain species from extinction due to pressures and pressures from international trade? In the case of IUCN, uh, they have specific categories for defining fish as globally threatened with extinction, as shown by the bracketed boxes or of less concern boxes above. Importantly, this is a species based model. So, stocks in one part of the planet that differ from stocks of the same species in another part of the planet all fall under one determination. The wording here for not um, threatened with extinction is unfortunate because it just said, well, they're near threatened, which uh, sometimes when reported in the media, is the, the nuance is often lost in this kind of discussion. Anyway, let's move on. IUCN assessments, these red list assessments, do overlap with those of the fisheries people, the community, where outcomes can be complementary or in some cases present challenges. This happens over space and time as fisheries is stock, not species-based, and fisheries assessments are typically run at more timely, regular periods. So if we look at the grid uh, of this generic graph of an imaginary fish stock being fished and eventually overfished, in the case of fish species with a general generation time of about five years, um, you can see what's gonna happen. What happens when a fishery starts? In this case, up to the dotted line, vertical line, both fisheries and red list assessments agree with each other that there is no concern. 
with further stock declines, often well before maximum sustainable yield is reached, which is the target of fisheries, the process can clash in the outcomes of assessments. A species abundance falling by 30% in less than three generations, even if above MSY, can be categorized as globally threatened with extinction in the red list. This sets up diametrically opposed advice between the fisheries community and the biodiversity conservation processes and leads to some confusion and I must say some level of distrust because the messages coming from each are, are completely different. Let's move on a bit further down this imaginary stock. Uh, here's another period in the progression of fishing of a hypothetical stock where fisheries and IUC assessments are in alignment as these declines trigger both the maximum sustainable yield and IUCN red list criteria concerns. We move on. But lastly, the concern from fisheries practitioners again diverges from the IUCN focused risk assessments for fish populations that have collapsed but remain at low but stable densities. Here, fisheries manage, managers can maintain a high concern, while the IUCN um, never, it basically reverts to considering the species as of least concern. In other words, not globally threatened. And again, this is confusing to the fisheries community. They can be accused of not following the precautionary approach, but here it seems to be more precautionary than, than the biodiversity conservation community. So you're getting an idea here how the signal is getting mixed in the international arena. Let's move on to CITES. Yesterday, we heard a suggestion from Michael Grant that potentially CITES may offer useful trade control to counter failures in fisheries management that are well recognized. Um, CITES biological criteria for listing species in the appendices have a decision framework that differs from IUCN. And it's a binding uh, trade treaty, whereas IUCN's red list is not. It's more of a, it's not even really on its own to be used for setting conservation priorities. The instruction of the red list says to set conservation priorities, additional information must be taken into account. In the case of CITES criteria, the thresholds are different for terrestrial and aquatic species. However, let me share some insights that I've learned while working in this role for FAO. When I started in the role, little did I know that the arguing that would happen around a single catch quota within commercial fisheries or recreational and government science would be nothing compared to the social cultural complexity of negotiating across international government organizations, NGOs, government delegations, academics, and concerned civil society within CITES. In order for a species to be offered extraordinary management under CITES provisions, which offer trade controls, decisions of what species are in danger from trade need to be heard and voted on. So let's just have a quick look at the criteria that they use. CITES recognize different extinction risk between terrestrial and aquatic species, and the assessments use differing filter for each. Taking away the small number and area of distribution qualifiers used for terrestrial species and considering a more appropriate one for fish, which offers nuance on the abundance, decline, and productivity of the fish species under assessment. And within this role, FAO is man mandated as the UN agency for fisheries of providing expert advice of whether fish proposed for listing in um, CITES appendices meets or doesn't meet the CITES criteria. FAO does not tell governments how they should vote, but does, does give this advice in a number of formats, uh, be they reports, heavy reports, just general presentations and such like, even videos, summary sheets, summary sheets and the lot and the like. It should be noted that the characterization of species as globally threatened under the IOC and red list is generally used by proponents in all species proposals to advocate for listing for fish under CITES appendices, despite the different criteria used in each process. So there's, there's quite a bit of confusion in there, and this can add more to the tensions. And, and we've had a look at some of the range of advice coming into this overall international processes, which sets, a binding, sets up a binding treaty, you remember, uh, and, and luckily, you know, we've published this in Fish and Fisheries. It, just show, it does show that FAO advice and the fishery community's advice is, is very sound, even in retrospect. So why, why is this all important? Why am I dwelling on these questions of how to characterize the risk of marine fish populations to extinction? Well, it comes back to the knee joint and the articulation between managing fish stocks for sustainable use 
and protection of fish for, for biodiversity conservation. Ensuring the tasks that overlap between responsible government agencies are well invested in to deliver an effective and efficient outcome. In the case of fish more species, any CITES listing would need to be species based. And noting the range of species that are within the fisheries, likely closer to 100 than 50, the burden of servicing CITES provisions will likely fall uh, will be significant and will fall largely to CITES authorities, which can be distant to aquatic management agencies. So there's complexities in that. While long-term investment in expertise for the management of fish is usually vested outside of environment departments, that is where typically the ministries uh, are holding the management authorities of CITES. And a lack of appreciation of the subtleties of each functions can cause a problem and end up with this inflammation of this knee joint. So as you've heard in previous talks, halting over-exploitation over with oversight of fisheries departments for these high value, low volume commodities is a wicked challenge that is often underfunded and of variable success, sometimes not very successful, even in, in rich countries. So, so why not give the trade controls a chance? Well, I've just returned from a week of intergovernmental discussions on CITES listed seahorses that have come under CITES management for over 20 years. And there's evidence that countries are still struggling to manage trade um, under CITES after two decades, with most of these countries going to zero quotas or bans, yet illegal trade ongoing. And this is the, one of the biggest challenges we have for these very low volume, easy to smuggle species. So what's the answer? What is the answer? as each community, fisheries and environment agencies overpromise but underdeliver. Well, I, I'm gonna argue that one important shift in our thinking, which is happening, is around how we approach the problem. Here are two papers, one from 2006 and one from 2023. that move the needle from focus on catches or, so, or, or, or ecology, basically to socio-ecological systems, to understand how interventions across the whole value chains can work. In, in concert to make progress. Uh, so the first one really talks to the love of single tools where you're basically using a hammer to do everything. And the second one talks uh, in the context of doing ecosystem restoration is how to really bring about robust change and, and, and the need to move beyond just pure ecology. Okay, some closing thoughts because I'm sure you've heard enough from me. We really need a broad agreement on well-defined objectives. So what are we really trying to do? Are we stock rebuilding? Are we doing bycatch mitigation? Are we doing ecosystem restoration? What is it? Are we interested in livelihoods? And bring ourselves around the campfire around one or two of these where we recognize we're all doing the same thing. We need to continue to test long-held assumptions. There's a lot of truths out there that just are truths for the sake of being truths. So, you know, are the fish producing more going extinct? Is fishing of more its greatest threat? Do MPAs play a positive role for fishery sustainability? Are the trade plans, you know, a break on exploitation? Are CITES say, what can we do to make these things either true or put them aside and work on new assumptions? And here we just got a paper came out right today that basically points out in the last decades, the continent-wide declines we're seeing in shallow reef systems is largely a process. I'll just read it to you. The study indicates that warming climate has become a significant and probably overriding driver of change in coastal biodiversity. So this goes against the rhetoric of IPBES, IUCN, and, and all the other international processes that say fishing is the greatest pressure on biodiversity in the ocean. So, I'm not saying we should give up on what we're doing, but we have to really consider what we're trying to do and what's, what are the main pressures we're dealing with. Thirdly, I think we need to link the top-down approaches with bottom-up approaches. We're not so much good at this. Uh, all management comes at a cost, and we don't want to wait to put in a speed limit, you know, for a time when we can enforce this by 100% compliance. But we do need to recognize and be respectful of the ability to comply. So when we're putting in fisheries controls and we're putting in trade controls, is it the poorest that are always gonna suffer the worst? And we recognize the squeezing of the balloon analogy. Don't jump on one part of the problem only for the other, you know, another area of the problem to balloon out. 
These problems are not more centric. They are generic problems for species such as sea cucumber, fish moor, shark fin, and other. So we need to work as a team right across these different communities of practice. What are the learnings from these other situations that can be transferable and what can we offer them? We need to invest in new technologies. And here we heard from uh, Bayan and, 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 and Stan, identifying commodities and trade through image recognition and um, using genetic tools like close kin remarcher recapture to understand what are the real populations of these, these um, these species and also bringing more transparency to the value chain is coming and it's coming really fast. In five years, we've, we've blown ourselves out of water and what we understand and where we can find the information. And I suspect that with the, if I was starting today, I'd be going into genetics and, and conservation because we are gonna have fantastic tools. Don't throw away what we've got, but let's all start investing also in what we need to drive machine learning deep learning, AI opportunities, and the use of genetics technologies to, to make our job doable. Uh, actions across the whole value chain. This speaks really to those two papers. We know that if we want fisheries to change, we can't just deal with the stock, even if we do it in an ecosystem approach. We have to understand the markets. We have to understand consumption and livelihoods, community awareness. We have to understand with the fishers and their motivations and the government's levers we have. So we really have to deal with the big problems and not just pick off the bit we want and just drive without context that one solution. And we re really need to recognize our capacity and finance limitations. And that's very well argued in uh, Graham Egg's new paper, the paper that just came out today. We need to ask for more, but leverage what's available. So what are the resources and levers that are, that are out there? And, and can we approach them as a consolidated group with environment and fisheries industry interests sitting together asking for the same things so we get that political opportunity, which is lost when we're all shouting with very different voices, basically wanting the same thing, but asking for very different things to get there. And to get management to work, think of a system as a whole and put yourself in the mind of others in your country and region. So very often we're trying to put in things from the top without any context of what's really happening on the ground, be they customs officers, village organizers, people on the water or country managers. And equally, you know, those people need to see the opportunities of bringing international political will to these, to these problems. So we've got a big job to do, and I'm just hope this talk, if it tells you one thing is to push us to speak clearer with one voice about the dynamic state and system importance of the ocean and bring all the levers to bear and toggle where we can to focus uh, to assist conservation of aquatic species in a place where it's very much needed and uh, maybe I would suggest highly overfunded. Thank you very much. Um, Sorry, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, that was me not pressing my unmute button yet again. Um, yeah, that was a great overview and certainly um, food for thought in terms of some of the, um, I, I, I suppose, op opposing um, assessment systems and opposing expectations. It's a bit of a theme that I'm going to be covering a bit next. Um, does anybody have any quick questions for Kim, please? And again, we can, um, I've got a question from Elizabeth. Elizabeth, please go ahead. Yes, thank you so much for um, the presentation, Kim. I just had a question in terms of, you said that they would have to be species specific. And I just wanted to add that there are um, examples where we're talking about products. Um, so for instance, you're aware that the crocodilian skins have a system with which they are tagged by the producers and are therefore traded that way. That takes um, level off from the customs, which means that the producers are labeling the species and it is then uh, exported and traded that way. So I, I was just wondering if you could refer again to what you mean would be the biggest problem in terms of listing fish maw on CITES. 
Thanks, Elizabeth. I think what, what you're saying and what you're getting at is, is novel approaches. And that one with uh, crocodile skins is a novel approach of, of the tagging skins. And I think there's an opportunity there because if we go through the typical entry point of, uh, let's say, all the species that I know of in CITES, they typically are proposed at a species level. Even if uh, half the world stocks, and we found this a lot with maybe shark species, take, for instance, silky shark. Silky shark is found throughout the globe, but was proposed for listing when it was uh, least concern on the IUCN red list. And uh, was accepted, even though really the, the main problem we had was a potential meeting of criteria off the east coast of South America. Yet the rest of the world would need to come under these uh, control. So what I'm saying is when you, when you list species under CITES, there isn't there is such a thing as a split listing, but it's it's highly frowned upon because it's so difficult to manage. I think what 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 you're suggesting and what I think is a very great idea is to start. Let's look at different ways of packaging and bring in different ways of um, looking at trade control. So, for example, any fish that is um, coming through air transport is there some type and we've tried to do this with customs codes but is there some type of packaging requirement which potentially requires some type of labeling requirement which then allows both the collection or monitoring evaluation and reporting of the trade but also allows quicker assessments by customs at the moment that isn't the case and a good example here would be the aquarium fishery the aquarium fishery does have a range of different ways of packaging their fish, which typically fly, fly air transport for the reasons that they live fish. And there's been some great studies in the US who have been able to get hold of packaging um, material that coming into US, USA, which does have certain labeling requirements that then feeds back into an overall status assessment. Now, these types of looking outside the box of ways of getting better data so we can do more informed management is something that you know needs greater attention and unfortunately at the moment isn't really a great focus within the uh, activity of say for instance CITES the last one I was talking about in that most of the money is is raised through family foundations and conservation organization to protect species but uh, I mean WCS is is working across a range of topics and it would be interesting to just look at potentially packaging packaging requirements for for fish products uh, how we could get this through international conventions so that airlines and shipping yeah, agencies like, yeah you use that maybe stan's got an idea on that he's got something to say uh, sorry i just joined in oh. it wasn't i don't have um anything to say sorry Okay, so I mean, th th this is an area where there's a lot of work um, in terms of, I mean, certainly I know from work that's being done by, say, the Marine Stewardship Council and others, the, um, the traceability, electronic traceability is, is all the rage at the moment, and there's certainly some opportunities there. Um, I've noted it down um, as one of the sort of areas, the sort of general areas that really needs to be explored. Um, any other quick questions for Kim before we before we move on? Okay, um, Kim, that was great. I mean, we really it, it's it's been good to have had some of that really detailed stuff on the ground where people have been going to the the fishing villages and then the sort of um, much higher um, global view of things and it's been one of the great things um, about this workshop is to have that mix. Um, I need to share my screen and um, for some reason um, I can't find the um, a sense. A, um, Liberty, I don't seem to have a, um, a share screen today. Hey, one moment, two seconds. How about now, is that working? 
No, um, there's, there's also um, Yvonne oh, has a question, uh, so I'm just going to give the floor sure. to Yvonne. Sure, yeah, I, I worked out what the problem was, and I know I do, yeah. Yeah, can you, can you hear me? Hello? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yes, you can. can. Okay, thanks a lot. Kim, um, that's a really great talk and um, some real reality checks, and I think bringing together the sort of I mean, I actually hate to separate conservation community and fisheries community because there's so many overlaps, obviously. Um, and in many ways, there's a kind of a, I think on both sides, a realization of the need to, to, to consider both sides. Um, so I just got a very quick comment, observation, I guess, and um, a couple of observations and, and a question. One is, uh, I think your point about joining the dots is very important. So many things in government, for example, a siloed. So I don't know to what extent in most countries, customs departments, um, statistics departments work with other departments, environmental and fisheries to bring some of these aspects together, like the trade controls and the need to, to join the dots um, across, across these departments. I think that's incredibly important going forward, it will be. One of the things, I haven't read the Edgar paper on the climate change piece, um, I think even even if it is the biggest factor, that doesn't mean we don't need to desperately address overfishing. And I know that's obvious, but what I have heard, not uncommonly in, in discussions um, in fisheries department is, oh, well, climate change is causing all the problems. We don't have to deal with overfishing. So I do worry that we're gonna to have to be careful not to be too diverted by climate change. We have to do both. We have to address both. And of course, those two of those are interrelated as well. Um, and then my question is this, um, I completely agree about the funding part. Um, often fishery management aspects are very underfunded. So my question, specific question is, why do you think that SDG 14 related activities is the least funded? And that was very interesting to me. Um, does this just reflect attitudes of governments towards the marine environment, towards problems of, of overfishing, um, sustainable use. I just wondered if you had any insights into that particular question. And thank you. Thank you, Yvonne. Um, I completely agree with you that your, your comment about there being some of the greatest conservationists in the fisheries community and some of the uh, people within conservation, biodiversity conservation, are very focused on people, as, as we've seen across the different kind of groups that make up, for example, IUCN or even, even within uh, CITES. Um, when it comes to climate change, um, this, will this is being used as an excuse, as you point out, by some people to say, ah, oh, you know, don't worry about what we're doing, it's all climate. And, and this is a, a massive problem in fisheries. Um, but in reality, I think the reason I, I'm presenting these ideas is because it's very hard to bring up the idea that we, we all need to get together and focus our greatest attention on our biggest threats. And the reason why uh, SG14 might not be receiving as much funds as they do might be similar to why the great focus on fisheries and not climate. Um, so, for example, if you're a government, your incentive is to look after your people. They're the ones who vote for you. And in general, um, people own land. They don't own the ocean. We all own the ocean. But in, in a way, what happens on land is, is politically often more important. You cannot move on land without somebody saying, hey, that's my land or your, or your, your development is going to change something here. So I think the political will of a government of what happens on land, where we all live and where we all have our livelihoods, most of us have our livelihoods on land. Um, you know, that tends to get the lion's share of, of, of maybe the interest. And I, sus I don't know if this is the case, it's something I'm just considering myself. The reason the, the conservation community is, seems to be very, very focused on 
And I see this daily that fisheries is the biggest threat to biodiversity conservation on the ocean, which you know I can show you multiple times being being argued by some of the biggest practitioners in biodiversity conservation is potentially that it's very hard to go and take on the vested interests of oil and gas and, and the like, which, yeah, we can't. And I, the reason why it's important to have that conversation is not to let fisheries off the hook where they're doing damage, but to make sure all of our funds don't get put into, um, into the types of approaches which might exclude fisheries, such as MPAs, when really the biggest pressures are far larger scale than the localized problems of fishing. And we need to get together facing all of our problems with the weight that they deserve. And I think this is something I'm, I'm very focused on, notwithstanding that we have to get fisheries right. So thank you. Great, yeah, thank you very much, Kim. Okay, thank you. Um... So uh, I think it's my turn now um, to um, continue some of the bigger picture. Um, I need to find my presentation. Um, okay. If I share the screen. Oh, now I've got it. Okay. Sorry, everybody. Um, no worries. You fixed it just by asking about it, Liberty. <laughs> cool. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to look at um, the the management side of things and how do we um, encourage um, further progress towards good fisheries management and to particularly look at tropical developing countries because a lot of the species that we're talking about um, and a lot of the countries that we've been talking about are um, um, tropical and or developing countries. So I wanted to cover these areas um, about the, the opportunities and challenges. Um, and we just heard Kim talk about, and we've heard other people talk about um, the livelihoods and the importance of fishery resources. Um, we've already heard some comments about um, the unknowns and um, they're quite widespread for um, the, the um, fisheries for more. Um, we're known there are some significant impacts and I'll just, um, we've already heard a number of presentations about that. Um, but I think there's also quite a legacy of um, past inaction on fisheries management that has to be dealt with. I've been doing some work in Cambodia recently and looking through the literature, a lot of the seeds of the problems were created 30, 40, 50 years ago. Um, I think in terms of a cautionary tale, um, you know, one of the main aspects of fisheries management is about managing ex expectations because we can't satisfy everybody's needs or, desired, or desires from the, um, the fish stocks that are, that are in their own backyard. In looking at um, you know what's to this sort of the, the uh, big picture, we can see here. This is from the Random Myers Legacy um, database, looking at the number of assessed stocks around the world, and you can see certainly in um, in Asia, um, very very small numbers of fish stocks are, have been assessed, and noting that. Um, you know, what is in this um, database is only a proportion of the fish stocks around the world, but it does it does paint a, an early picture of the challenges that are faced. Even within countries where there's not the, um, the, the there may be fish stock assessments which haven't been entered into the, the RAM legacy database, there is a lot of evidence of depletion. Um, on either a, a species basis or a multi-species basis, and certainly um, abundant evidence of that in the Gulf of Thailand, which I've looked at quite a lot over the last few years. Despite international um, arrangements about and concerns about um, excess fishing capacity and fishing efforts, some people may remember the, um, the sunken billions report done by the World Bank. There is a um, an international agreement on the need to um, to uh, control fishing capacity, um, but we also know that um, illegal fishing um, it remains an ongoing and significant issue, and there has been a lot of time and effort 
but focused on seeking better controls over illegal fishing. And I think Kim just mentioned earlier that um, even where governments try to institute bans, um, then um, the um, <coughs> pirate traders continue to just circumvent those. And um, we've had a number of comments about pressing on the balloon. Um, certainly solutions which focus on one issue simply transfer the problem to another area. And we've seen some big picture, uh, you know, sort of large scale examples of that where inshore overfishing has resulted in in um, governments facilitating transfer of fishing effort offshore without actually controlling the fishing effort and resulting in an offshore depletion. I, I would say in terms of the areas that I've been working in that um, in recent years, Thailand has started to tackle um, some of the, the root causes of the, the overfishing issues and has reduced um, capacity in its industrial fleet quite significantly. And they're starting to see um, some results from that in terms of rebuilding of fish stocks. And it's a pattern which has been um, repeated in previous years by a lot of developed countries when they've got their fishing effort, fishing city under control. We've heard a lot of comment about um, lack of information. And certainly um, if we look at the, the three, those three FAO, reporting regions 71, 51 and 57, um, we see very high percentages of um, fisheries in the not elsewhere incorporated capacity. So these are um, catches which are not subdivided into species or stocks. And in some respects, there's good reason for that. There are you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of species um, and it's almost impossible to monitor them all. But um, a lot of this NEI category um, really needs some more focused effort to, um, to tease it out further. And you can see there's some progress um, if you look at Area 71, for example, but it still remains um, a, um, a significant problem. We know and we've seen from some of the previous presentations um, that fishing is having an impact, um, not just on fish stocks, but also on um, associated species. Um, there's commonly a lot of focus on the large scale fleets um, and, and there's plenty of examples where they continue to have an impact, but it's also true that small scale fishing is having an impact. And there was a recent paper looking at the primary threats to um, conservation dependent species, you know, such as the, the sharks and turtles and a few other things. And the, um, the small scale fisheries play a significant role and that can't be overlooked. Um, in terms of um, sort of general controls over fishing activities, we see certainly in some <coughs> of the Asian countries that I've been working in poor controls over the trawl sector um, and which threaten critical habitats. Um, we know that trawl fisheries can be well managed and um, but what we see in many countries is a generic lack of control over excess fishing capacity and that includes trawls, but also includes other types of fishing gears as well. We've seen um, a number of presentations about um, the diversity of species. I think it was uh, Dr. Akalesh yesterday who mentioned um, a wide variety of gear types. Um, there has been a bit of a focus on, on the gill nets, but there are also um, sources of um, fishing pressure from the trawls, um, long lines, um, all sorts of fishing gear categories. And as I mentioned earlier, um, it's not just in industrial scale, but a mixture of industrial and small scale fleets, maybe targeting different areas or different species groups. In, in the tropics, species composition is extremely diverse. Um, and you know, we've had a lot of focus on the cyanids, but there's also, I think it was uh, Bayan yesterday who mentioned that in his work that he'd found, I think it was 73 species um, of, um, of fish being used for their maw in his work in China. So incredible diversity, different species with different values, different life history strategies, different vulnerabilities to, to fishing gear. When we look at um, tropical fisheries and fishing gears, there's no such thing as um, totally selective gear. Um, there was a lot of focus 
in the 1980s on um, shifting to selective fishing. But in terms of um, you know, trying to make gear very selective for particular species or size ranges, it's, it's almost impossible just due to the wide range of species and sizes and shapes of these animals. The other attribute in the tropics, and in particularly, um, is, is that there's a market for everything and everything goes to market. And there's a long, long history of that, particularly in, in Asia. Um, people have access to a wide variety of species, often in relatively low volumes. And so people have been very innovative in um, what they use these species for. And in fact, there's a general belief that there's very little discarding in many of the tropical um, Asian countries just because um, there's a buyer for everything. Uh, we've also heard, though, that in comparison to a lot of um, fisheries management in other parts of the world where volume is, is important, um, you know, target species are often the, um, the high volume ones. We um, have evidence from some of the fisheries for more that value may be more important as a driver and therefore um, it needs to be a key consideration in terms of the um, setting of management provisions. We, we expect too much from our fisheries. Um, we, we expect the fisheries to employ people, to provide food for people, um, we expect them to be a source of um, you know, profit or, or, or gain of some, some sort. And there are, there's plenty of work being done on just this um, clash of expectations there where it's, it's impossible to uh, um, Maximize everything. So on the right hand side, to to uh, uh, overfishing, and there are many examples of this. The shift to maximum sustainable yield um, pushes the the um, the level of effort back and rebuilds fish stocks um, and produces more from the fish stock than an open access fishery. But there's an increasing interest in pushing. Um, catches even further to the left, where we take the pressure off the fish resources, allowing a larger biomass, and then move to a maximum econ economic yield. So th that's a theoretical graph, but in looking at the Gulf of Thailand, which is a multi-species complex, um, we can see the results of some modelling where the blue circle on the right-hand side is, um, is on the wrong side of the curve when it comes to overfishing. Um, MSY, the yellow dot in the middle, the red dot on the left-hand side is the maximum economic yield, and the green dot to the left of that is um, where you would set your fishing capacity for maximum ecosystem protection. So I, the key message from this slide is that it's pretty much um, impossible to maximize everything in terms of expectations from a fishery. Um, Kim mentioned earlier about um, maximum sustainable yield because it's written into international law. Um, but we know from um, multi-species fisheries that you can't manage all fish stocks at their individual MSY. And the left-hand graph shows that if you have um, fishing effort <coughs> optimised for the blue species, then you're going to overfish the orange species. And and so it become when there's hundreds of species involved, it's almost impossible to work out what is a um, th 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 there is basically no way of trying to ensure that everything is is optimally fished. The other interesting um, outcome from this is governments often calculate um, sustainable yields from individual fish stocks and then add them up and. That's a, um, a common mistake, but it can overestimate the total yield from a system by between 25 and 50%. And the reason for that is they're not taking account of predation in the ecosystem. And so much more sophisticated ways of 
managing the fishing effort are needed if we're going to be um, a getting the most from these systems but be not resulting in some species being depleted below their point of recruitment impairment. So I think in looking at what would be um, the role of fisheries management, um, there needs to be some clarity of expectations, getting stakeholders of all types together um, around the table and generating an understanding that not everybody can maximise what they want. Um, is conversation who the food will want commercial activity. Um, what we've learned from countries which have been able to get their fisheries under control is that there needs to be some controls over who can actually go fishing. And in some respects, that's a, uh, a journey back to the past where um, you know, local communities were often quite um, firm about who was allowed to fish in their areas and who wasn't. And it was the, the shift to this viewing the oceans as commons where everybody could fish that really opened up the, the problems with um, open access and making the allocations a lot clearer. We've heard a lot of comment about collecting information and that's great but um, it's not if it's a, if it's an excuse to do nothing and postponing decisions which are at times blindingly obvious. The other thing I'd like to comment on is we hear a lot about the ecosystem approach to fisheries management and co-management. All of these concepts are really useful and certainly the way forward in terms of modern fisheries management, but they do need to be operationalised. And um, because at the moment, in my experience, the, too many, the, 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 the broad concepts are too broad and, um, and there needs to be some Sort of coming down to earth and how these things are actually operationalized. I mentioned earlier about volume versus value. Um, in the literature there's a lot of discussion about target and bycatch, um, but I think that that often obscures some of the, um, the, the way in which these fisheries um, can operate, that the, the species of interest will change um, you know, on either a seasonal basis, and that can be on a monsoon basis, or they may change from year to year depending upon um, abundance. And I think it's maybe time to move to slightly different terminology about what are the species which determine the main management requirements. Um, they may be the target, they may be the bycatch, and they may be the volume, they may be the value, but I think some clarity in what the management is aiming for is the key message here. Um, the other species group to think about um, are what we call indicator species. So not just monitoring the, the management determining species, but ensuring those that are vulnerable to fishing pressure um, are not driven to a stage where they um, um, get lower than their point of recruitment impairment and potentially get listed as, um, as threatened. So the job ahead, um, depending upon which part of the world, and I recognise that the more fisheries have been developing in recent years in some places. Um, Michael's work on Papua New Guinea goes clearly as well as Brian Elizabeth's work. But in other countries, there's a, a legacy uh, of, um, of open access and trying to deal with that is a very, very thorny problem. But um, as I mentioned earlier, Thailand has done a... Um, a lot of work to reduce their, their fishing effort to levels where they're starting to see some um, rebounding of stocks. There's also no one size fits all. Um, there'll be tailored solutions. And, and my observation of fisheries agencies is that there's often, um, because of you know, funding and lack of training, um, a, sort of a, a lack of capacity to be able to recognize um, what needs to be done and a vulnerability to um, simple solutions and, and pressures. Uh, I that management plans are needed. That's a to get together and agree on things like objectives to make sure that the, the broader issues are, are, are covered and not get distracted by 
the implementation of the single tools. And lastly, um, engaging stakeholders is um, is really important, and not just um, small scale stakeholders, but bringing in and maybe not even just fishers, but bringing in the supply chain as well. Um, diagram in the middle was some work that we did in in Vietnam, where we looked at um, getting stakeholders, both in the supply chain and fishers, together to have a conversation about. Um, yeah, how, how would they describe a good result in their fishery? How would they describe a satisfactory result? And how would they describe an unsatisfactory result? So this is like a, a qualitative approach to setting um, you know, target and limit reference points and, and trigger points in a fishery, but doing it in a way where um, stakeholders are actively engaged. At, at the moment, there's a lot of focus on high science and numbers and mathematical models, whereas I think that engaging people um, and tapping into their knowledge about what, what works and what doesn't um, can be a very useful way in uh, making progress. Um, yeah, so that brings me to the end of my um, presentation. I'm happy to take some questions before we, before we move on. Uh, Ken. Duncan, uh, uh, good presentation. It's uh, good to see Thailand is uh, managing its fisheries and uh, managing their fishing effort well. I'm just curious about uh, how aquaculture and uh, fisheries imports may be contributing to uh, relieving the fishing pressure on their capture fisheries. Thank you. On on Thailand's capture fisheries? Yes, yes. How aquaculture and imports fisheries products imports may be contributing to the helping them to better manage their capture fisheries. Um my um my gut feeling is not very much um i think the demand for seafood is so great around the world that um production from aquaculture is just being soaked up by the um but by the marketplace and and it's also the same with um imports and what works is getting the fishing effort under control and um, unless that's done, then things like um, artificial stocking or artificial reefs or any of those sorts of things are not really going to address the fundamental problems. And so, I mean, Thailand has, I think, started out in the 60s, um, but by the mid 1960s, they had 3,000 um, trawl vessels by. They then expanded into purse seining by the, I think the mid eighties, there was a known 14 odd thousand vessels. Um, they're now back to where they were in the mid sixties with about 3000. And so that's a pretty big decline, but um, you see that in other places. In my state in New South Wales, when I started my career, there were about 8,000 commercial fishermen. We're now down to about 1,000. Um, we still have one and a half million people go recreational fishing, which um, they seem to believe it's harmless. But um, there's certainly um, pretty big cuts in, in what people can catch and the results uh, are there for people to see in terms of stock recovery. Um, Simone, I saw your hand up for a second. Is that, but now it's gone. No, yeah, sorry, that was that was by accident. I was trying to oh, clap. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. Um, well, unless anybody's got any um, quick questions, then um, we need to um, hand over to Julian. So Julian is based here in, in New South Wales at our Department of Primary Industries, and um, he works on stock assessments uh, for some of the key species 
of importance for both commercial and recreational um, fishers. And he's going to talk about um, one of the, um, he calls it iconic and it's very true. Everybody dreams of catching a Malawi Julian. Thanks, Duncan. Let me get the share screen organized. Yep. Does that look, does that, is there yep, a bunch of it. lovely Mulloway there for you to look at? <laughs> All yep. right, that's great. Thanks, Duncan. Um, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Uh, so my presentation today is not specifically about fisheries or trade in fish moors, but this is obviously a huge issue for species with large valuable swim bladders like the species I'm going to talk to you about today, uh, the iconic Mulloway, Igyrosomus japonicus, uh, which is a large croaker species. Uh, for which management is a huge challenge for us uh, where I'm from in New South Wales, Australia. So that's what I'm going to focus on today. Um, in New South Wales, Mulloway is an important commercial species. It's highly regarded food fish. It's also, uh, as Duncan mentioned, a truly iconic recreational fish species, very popular sport fish, which grows to large sizes. And it's also uh, very important to First Nations peoples in Australia, so Aboriginal cultural fishes, for whom Mulloway is a, a totemic species. So, Gyrosimus japonicus is known by various common names depending on where in the world you are. Um, some include Jewfish, Ikob, um, Japanese Mega, and Silver Croaker. The species is found in Southern Africa, parts of coastal India and Pakistan, parts of coastal China, Japan, and Korea. And in Australia, it's found around the entire southern seaboard um, from sort of central Queensland around to central Western Australia. Within Australia, the genetic structure of the species has established separate eastern and western genetic stocks, as well as two genetic stocks uh, in southern Australia, one at the head of the Great Australian Bight uh, and one uh, in sort of eastern South Australia and western Victoria. Evidence from of chemistry work and various movement studies suggest the potential for much finer scale subpopulation structuring within those big genetic stocks. So some of the movement studies I just mentioned uh, have shown the species to be, like many croakers, primarily resident in estuaries and nearshore marine waters. So some of our work has shown a median movement distance of just four kilometres between tag and recapture often after really, really extensive periods at liberty. More than 70% of tagged fish in one study were recaptured less than 10 kilometers from where they were released, uh, and over 80% recaptured in the exact same estuary where they were tagged. But a small proportion uh, are capable of moving larger distances in the, in the, of the scale of hundreds of kilometers. So they are capable of long distance movements, but they're generally a highly resident animal. So adults are found from the upper tidal reaches um, of estuaries all the way out to offshore marine waters in 100 metres depth. In all of these habitats, they closely associate with structure, whatever structure is there, be it man-made or natural. And juveniles um, are primarily found in estuaries, but are also found in nearshore coastal environments like the surf zones of ocean beaches. But in contrast to many estuarine species in New South Wales, where habitats like seagrass and mangroves are important nursery habitat for small juvenile mulloway, deep holes in estuaries are the key nursery habitat. And in all of these habitats for adults and juveniles, Mulloway primarily associate with the bottom. So they're a classic, classic demersal species. Growth is reasonably fast. And as you can see from the spread of uh, size at age, uh, we see here, it's highly variable. On average, they reach 34 centimeters after one year, 52 after two years and 92 centimeters after five years. Um, and they can grow to large sizes. So your average maximum size um, for the species um, in this, uh, with this growth model here is around 140 centimetres. And they're also capable of considerable longevity. So the maximum age recorded in New South Wales is 34 years, but they have been reported up to 42 years in South Africa. Size of maturity is approximately 70 centimetres for females, and that occurs after between three and four years. 51 centimetre for males, so a bit smaller. Fecundity is approximately half a million eggs per kilo. So a just mature female is capable of producing um, 1.7 million eggs per spawning batch, up to an estimated 17 million eggs per batch for a 
150 centimetre fish. Spawning occurs between November and March, and in typical croaker style, this occurs in the lower reaches of estuaries and in near shore marine waters adjacent to estuaries where the species forms spawning aggregations. My recruitment is strongly linked to favourable environmental conditions, so successful recruitment, and then specifically high rainfall, which is often separated by long periods of unfavourable drought conditions uh, in Eastern Australia. So in the top graph here, uh, we see year, we have year class strength, so the columns um, through time from 1988 to 2013, plotted against rainfall, which is the, the black line. You can see that strong and weak year classes in the commercial catch are strongly related to rainfall in the birth year of those year classes. So strong year classes above the line correspond to high rainfall in that year and weak year classes below the line correspond to low rainfall in that birth year. In the bottom graph, we see the commercial landings of Mulloway bars over the same period, 1988 to 2013, also strongly correlated with rainfall, the, the black line, but in this case, it's rainfall two to three years earlier, uh, which is approximately how long it takes a Mulloway to grow to the, the then minimum legal length of 45 centimetres during that period. So high Mulloway landings correspond to good rainfall two to three years earlier, and lower landings are similarly related to lower rainfall two to three years earlier. For a typical Teleos predator, uh, and that changes from mainly small crustaceans when juveniles to increasingly teleosts and cephalopods when adults. When large, Mulloway are one of the highest order predators you'll find in a New South Wales estuary with the possible exception of some shark species. So they're, they're a higher, really a real higher order predator. Um, as I mentioned at the very start, Mulloway are important as a fishery species across all the harvesting sectors in New South Wales. So the, the, for the commercial fishery, they're a highly desirable table fish. They're worth between an estimated one to two million dollars per year at the point of first sale, so to the fishers. They're also a highly prized angling sport fish for recreational fishers. They're a popular spear fishing target and they're a key species in New South Wales uh, recreational fishery, which is worth an estimated three billion dollars a year. They're also a totemic species for Aboriginal cultural fishers and Mulloway. Uh, name Mulloway is an, an Aboriginal word, which means the, the greatest one. So we have commercial landings data back to the 1940s, uh, and we see that they're fairly variable from 1940 up to around the early 1970s. And then there was a huge surge in landings through the 1970s and 80s of between you know, 200 and 400 tonnes a year. Since there's been a steady decline to just 37 tonnes in 2008, and landings have sort of bounced around between 50 and 90 tonnes since then. We have four point estimates for the recreational catch not directly comparable to each other because of the use of different sampling frames for the surveys, but they do show that the recreational catch is comparable in size to the commercial catch for each point estimate. One that really stands out is this one here for 2001, 274 tonnes. This was for the species grouping uh, Mulloway Jewfish, which included another local cyanid uh, pteroglin. So this estimate is for both species combined. In terms of the commercial fisheries which contribute to the overall commercial catch, the three most important are the estuary general fisheries, so the, the green bars here which use gill nets in estuary waters, um, the ocean trap and line fishery, which the yellow parts of the bars which use line fishing methods in ocean waters, and then the ocean haul fishery in red which use haul nets uh, to target Mulloway on ocean beaches. So the estuary general fishery has historically provided the majority of the catch around 65% since 1997. Overall, the ocean trap and line has provided a decreasing contribution uh, over, the, over this time period. The ocean haul fishery occasionally lands large amounts, uh, for example, in 2006 and again in 2011, and I'll explain why that happens later on. There's also been a steady decline in commercial fishing effort, which, which uh, I think Duncan mentioned again since 1997, which mirrors the decline in landings we see on the previous slide. So for estuary gill netting here in blue and offshore line fishing we see in orange, there's been a downward trend in the number of days effort with 2027 number, the 2021 number, the lowest so far recorded for both those methods. So there's been concerns for the health of the Mulloway stock since at least the early 2000s and likely for considerably longer. And that's a result of a, 
a long-term decline in landings. A uh, catch that until 2018 was dominated by juveniles uh, and data which shows fewer and fewer large fish being caught through time. As a result, the species has been formally assessed to be depleted in all stock assessments since the first assessment undertaken in the early 2000s. The current spawning biomass is estimated to be less than 20% uh, of unfished. So concerns for the stock as a result of these uh, fairly depressing assessments has prompted a raft of management changes for the species, starting in 2013 with a thing called the Mulloway Recovery Program, where the recreational bag limit was decreased from five fish to two fish per fisher per day. Minimum legal length was increased from 45 to 70 centimetres, 70 centimetres being the size of maturity for female Mulloway. There was a bycatch allowance of undersized fish allowed for the estuary gillnet fishery and a 500 kilo possession limit was, was, um, was put in place for the, the ocean hall beach net fishery. Continued decline in stock health resulted in a bunch more management changes in 2018, including the removal of the undersized um, fish bycatch allowance for estuary gill netters, a further decrease in the recreational bag limit from two fish to just one, one fish per angler per day. And the species was also prioritised for harvest strategy development as part of those uh, management changes. So in terms of management of this species, Across all New South Wales commercial fisheries, current management arrangements uh, include effort restrictions in terms of limited access to the fishery uh, and also in terms of the number of days per year that commercial fishers can fish. But they also include a bunch of really complicated management arrangements um, by fishery. So for the estuary general gillnet fishery, restrictions on net length, there are restrictions on soak time, so the amount of time the nets can be fished for and the number of nets that can be used. For the ocean trap and line offshore line fishery, there's restrictions on the number of hooks, the line, the number of lines that can be used. The ocean hall beach net fishery, there's restriction on the number of, number of the amount, the, the weight of fish that can be landed, uh, 500 kilos per endorsement holder. And then there are a bunch of spatial closures fishing, including marine park sanctuary zones, which are closed to all fishing, and recreational fishing havens, which are estuaries that are completely closed to all commercial fishing. So then in the recreational side, um, there's a size limit of 70 centimetres total length. And as I said before, that's approximately the size of maturity for female mulloway. There's a bag limit of one fish, a daily bag limit. There's also a possession limit of one fish. So you're only allowed to have a single fish in your possession at any one time. Then there are those uh, marine park sanctuary zones I mentioned, which are closed to, to all forms of fishing. So all these complex management arrangements are partly a consequence of the challenges in managing this species in New South Wales within a multi-sector, multi-fishery, multi-gear, multi-species context. And the first major challenge that we have is that the genetic stock on the east coast of Australia spans the adjoining jurisdictions of Queensland to the north and Victoria to the south, which have their own management arrangements for the species that are in some cases very different to, to New South Wales. And as I've mentioned earlier, there are multiple sectors that exploit this stock. So there's the commercial sector, a substantial recreational sector, uh, and an Aboriginal cultural um, sector. And then within each sector, there are multiple specific fisheries that target and catch mulloway. So within the commercial sector, there's the three, the three fisheries that I've talked about a bit. There's the estuary general gillnet fishery, the ocean trap and line offshore line fishing fishery, and the ocean hall beach net fishery. Then within each of these fisheries, there are multiple gear types that fishers use to catch mulloway. So for example, in the commercial gillnet fishery and estuaries, there are many different types of gillnets, which use many different mesh sizes, are configured differently depending on the species being targeted, whether they're mulloway or something different, as well as the sizes of fish being targeted. And then there are multiple different haul nets within the beach net fishery, multiple different line fishing methods that catch mulloway. And even within the recreational fishery, the species is a really popular angling species, but they're also um, highly sought after by spear fishermen. And on top of all of those, Mulloway are taken by both targeted fishing, but many are also taken as incidental catch when targeting other species. 
and we have some pretty significant issues with, with both of these. So for targeted fishing, we don't ha currently have a good handle on rates of discarding and post-discard mortality for the species for either commercial or recreational fishing for juveniles or for, for adults. Then we also have incidental catch. And there's a couple of major fisheries and gear types where Mulloway bycatch is a huge issue at the moment. The first is the bycatch of high numbers of large juveniles. So below the, the minimum legal length, but they're large, large juveniles. And this, this primarily happens when uh, fishers are targeting other small bodied species using gill nets and estuaries. There's also bycatch of small juveniles in prawn trawl fisheries in both estuaries and the ocean. So small juvenile mulloway are roughly the size and shape of some of our exploited prawn species. They sometimes get taken uh, in large numbers, particularly in inshore ocean waters during flood events, when the prawns and the juvenile mulloway are pushed out to sea. And sometimes this results in the bycatch of thousands of juvenile mulloway uh, per, per trawl shot. And then there's the targeting of spawning aggregations. This is a classic issue with croakers worldwide, particularly by offshore line fishers who are able to identify aggregations really well and really easily using improved sounder technology. We also have targeting of fish which are undertaking pre-spawning migrations by estuary gill netters and by beach haulers. There's currently no catch caps, so the targeting of aggregations and those pre-spawning migrations can take huge numbers of fish in a very short period of time. We also have marketing of recreational catch, which is a big issue in some areas where recreational fishes are sold to retailers or consumers, or they're sold to commercial fishes to be uh, sold on. Then compliance is a huge issue. So we have just over a hundred compliance offices statewide. Um, that's, that's coastal New South Wales and inland New South Wales. Um, are they, and not just, not just to come, to enforce Mulloway compliance is to enforce compliance of all commercial and recreational fishing regulations. There are around 500 commercial fishers that catch Mulloway, but there's around a million recreational fishers. Um, so that's a huge challenge, compliance. So as I mentioned earlier, Mulloway have been prioritised for harbour strategy development in New South Wales, which is widely regarded as world's best practice in fisheries management involves a working group containing representatives from all the harvesting sectors, so commercial, recreational, Aboriginal cultural fishers, who come together to come up with agreed objectives for the Mulloway fishery and predetermined management actions to achieve those objectives. Even within this process, there are huge challenges because the objectives vary hugely by sector. So for recreational fishers, larger fish are, are, are their objective. Whereas for Aboriginal cultural fishers, high abundances to support cultural fishing practices is, is their objective. And for commercial fishers, it's to maximize, maximize profits regardless of fish size or abundance. So at the moment, we're currently charged with rebuilding a depleted stock for this species in New South Wales. But like many croaker species, Mulloway have a suite of biological and ecological characteristics which make it inherently susceptible to overexploitation. So as I mentioned before, they have highly episodic recruitment uh, linked to favorable environmental conditions, which occurs irregularly. So the stock is really reliant on a small number of strong year classes to sustain the fishery through sometimes extended periods of poor uh, or no recruitment. They're also highly resident and they're a strongly schooling species. So they can easily become locally depleted under high fishing pressure. And of course they form spawning aggregations and undertake spawning migrations where large numbers of individuals can be easily targeted and caught by fishers. Which brings us finally to uh, what we've been talking about for the last two days, uh, moors. So Mulloway are a large bodied croaker species with a large, thick, smooth, thick walled, smooth swim bladder, making them almost an ideal species for the harvesting of moors. They're worth up to $20 a kilo at the point of first sale for their flesh. Adding the huge value that the moor provides could add considerable value generated from the harvest, which could potentially increase targeting and illegal fishing uh, for an already depleted species. And the value of Mulloway moors is only just starting to be realised uh, in the last couple of years in some local areas with fish increasingly being sold, gilded and gutted, so 
having the moors removed before being sold for their flesh. Um, and of course, this potentially represents yet another challenge for an already challenging species. Thanks everyone very much for listening. Um, does anybody have any questions? Maybe I'll just jump in while, oh, actually Kim's got a question. Go for it, Kim. Sorry, Julian, this is a bit nerdy, but uh, when you, when you, over your study of, of your fish, have you found that the uh, increased rainfall in your mind helps the fish uh, avoid predation or do you think it's more of a diet based opportunity for the, the young that boosts their later recruitment? That's a really good question, Kim, and we're not sure exactly what the mechanism is. We know that there's a relationship, but we're not sure exactly what the mechanism is. As part of that, uh, that work that we did that, that showed that, that clear um, correlation between year class strength and rainfall and, and landings and rainfall, um, we also looked at the, uh, the landings of a key Mulloway food item, the school prawn, uh, and there was also a, a very close relationship between abundance of school prawns uh, and those strong and weak Mulloway year classes. So while we don't exactly know what the mechanism is, it, it absolutely could be. Um, it, I'll, you know, it, it could be. It could be um, avoid avoiding predation, but I think it's it's likely a combination of that and and your other suggestion, which is um, food abundance, food availability. Mm. I've just pointed that out because we have the same problem in Western Australia. Drying climate means that all of our estuary sort of bottom of the chain species are just falling apart out in Western Australia, which is causing a big problem there as well. So, but sorry, back to Fishmore. <laughs> I just, just one quick observation, um, Julian. You know that big increase in in catch in the seventies corresponds to where. Um, huge numbers of uh, commercial fishing and there was no limit on the number of licenses and that obviously did quite a bit of damage to the um, to the fish stock and um, and then the increase in popularity of angling also probably helped after that so um, are there any um, other questions that people have um, So Jeff, um, is that to um, Julian, that was. Sorry, Duncan, you, you're just you're just breaking up a little bit. But in terms of um, in terms of Jeff's suggestion of Bob Carney's book, um, yes, I have read it. Uh, it's an excellent read, and it, it is a an excellent personal account of of Bob's experience uh, with Mulloway. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, so a mind-boggling problem for sure and um and there's you know at least we've got some resources um in our, our state fisheries department but in a lot of countries is much less so very much more challenging um so yeah m many many thanks for that um it's good to sort of explore all angles of this um uh, of the management side of things you know from you know Kim's and then specifically to you know to one species we're, we're going to take a quick break um we could cut back the break to 10 minutes um because we're a little bit over time um and our next speaker is Ken Yohanji and um uh, so if we could be back online it's now um half past the hour if we could be back at um in 10 minutes time that would be great thank you so we'll welcome everybody back. Um, we still have three presentations to to go through, and 
we're starting to get quite a lot of um, um, diversity of input um, that we're going to have to, to, to grapple with. Um, I want to welcome Ken Yuhanji. Ken, I hope I've pronounced your name um, cor correctly. Um, so Ken is um, with the program for the environmental management at the Seas of East Asia. And um, I just want to, so Ken, if you're able to introduce yourself um, and also upload your, um, so I should share your presentation, that would be great. Thank you. Sorry about that. Okay. Thanks, Duncan, and thank you, everyone. Um, Kenneth, um, I work for the at sea project out of our team of seas ecosystem action that's implemented by PMC and the PNG component is uh, co uh, funded and implemented by Papua New Guinea National Fisheries Authority. So my presentation will uh, discuss about some of the work we're doing for the project in our part of um, Data for a uh, sea, which is South Fly in the Western province, and also discuss a bit on what uh, NFA is doing in terms of uh, managing the fishing. Give me a few seconds and I'll um, share my screen. Hey, everyone, see my screen okay? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Fish more. Um, in the PNG, the current status is um, FISMO uh, has not been a, really a focus of the fishery management uh, in Papua New Guinea until uh, quite recently. So as a result, it has not been uh, really regulated, the harvest and trade of that uh, bladder. So uh, it's not regulated by way of a manage, uh, management plan, but <clears throat> NFA has uh, been uh, issuing license and a, a shore-based fishery uh, license to uh, uh, manage how this uh, fishery is being uh, harvested. Okay, some information uh, that we have so far about our fishery uh, in PNG. So NFA and the project, ATC project, we have started uh, collecting uh, data on the fishery. Uh, we've started in Western Province, which is a focus area of uh, the ATC project. So the project uh, has a target to uh, manage the fishery in the project area uh, to reduce the harvest of fish mouse so that it's uh, maintained at a sustainable level. So that's a uh, Project. And at the same time, uh, for NFA's um, management plan, we are tr uh, trying to collect data and supply to NFA's uh, coastal fisheries uh, unit as well to uh, start work on that. So our focus area is uh, it's very small in terms of the Arafura Timosi project, Indonesia, Australia. I uh, have the largest sea space, uh, Timor-Leste, and then for us, uh, it's uh, squeezed between the mainland in southern PNG, Western Province, and Australia's uh, Torres Strait. So <clears throat> we have uh, collected some socioeconomic data uh, in the Western Province, uh, the South Fly Villages. Uh, our data, we've uh, uh, identified that there's about 9,000 fish more fish, uh, fishes in the South Fly, and uh, what 17% of uh, those uh, fishes are female folks. It's, uh, in terms of uh, their, where they are sold, there are local buyers in the village, in each of those villages that we have uh, surveyed, and Indonesian uh, buyers uh, who come to the village buy from uh, villages as well as uh, their agents that are based in the villages and are buying from other fishermen and women in the village. And some uh, do sell in Daru, but some mostly villages closer to 
Daro. There's some villages along the central coast and the eastern coast, which is uh, which close to Daro. There are some that uh, take it out straight uh, to Port Mosby via Daro to sell in the markets there. Okay, there are uh, various uh, species being harvested there. These we just uh, listed uh, five main species that are mainly targeted because of the value. Uh, from our data, the highest value uh, species is the uh, Kelly Coca with about $158 for a kilo, and uh, followed by the Black Spot Coca. So these are prices from the villages that buyers go and buy in the villages. The prices of, uh, offered by the buyers based in Daru are usually higher. But um, in most cases, the uh, villages uh, don't have the transport to take their fish more out to Daru. So they just wait for the, the village buyers and Indonesian traders to come and buy from the villages. So <clears throat> what do they do with the, the carcass is uh, from our surveys, we identified that most of the carcass are eaten or sold. Um, and only few are discarded. So what they uh, told us was that when they come back with the fish mine and um, extract the uh, more, they share among their family and um, clan members, and to others they sell within the within the villages. Uh, sold the carcasses cheaply to villages. Those villages uh, close uh, to Daru take them out to Daru fish market to sell them. Okay, uh, supply chain of uh, fish markets in South Fly. So most. No, uh, this uh, sold in Daru, uh, and about a yeah, significant number also sold their uh, fish mall in in the villages, and some about twelve percent uh, said we have, uh, to take the fish mall products across to uh, Morocco and Indonesia, and some are straight to Port Moresby, but. Um, for those who sold, who reported to have sold their fish more in the villages, I think uh, most of their, their fish more end up going across the border to Indonesia through those uh, Indonesian traders as well. Because uh, we've uh, identified that most of those uh, villages have uh, agents for Indonesian traders that come across the border. And from there, we uh, try to put together a, a market chain to get a, a clearer picture of what's going on there. So from the village, we have either the village buyer, who is usually an agent of somebody, uh, either a licensed buyer in Daru or Port Mosby or, uh, uh, or a trader coming across from Indonesia. So the villager, uh, go sales in Daru, village fishermen, a buyer of fishermen. Then from Daru, they export it out to Asian markets, usually in uh, Hong Kong, Singapore. Then uh, some take it uh, out straight to Port Mosby. And most of them in the villages, in the, the village buyer of fishermen uh, sell it to an Indonesian trader that comes across the border from Morocco. They then take it across back to, uh, into Indonesia and export it on from there. So, uh, what are some actions? Even though we didn't have a, a management plan to regulate this uh, fishery in PNG, but what are some actions that we are doing or trying to implement in the interim while we are working on the management plan? We've started uh, data collection on that uh, to develop the management plan. We started in Western province, and I think the next would be in Gulf province in Kikori. Those are two hotspot areas where fish for fishery is going. 
Um, in the meantime, uh, NFA is also looking at trying to establish and get set guidelines for fish harvest under the current uh, uh, show based license that uh, people apply for to uh, fish or harvest fish more. So at the moment, the show based license don't have any guidelines. They just apply and uh, state which fish they want to harvest and sell. In the case of fish more, they mentioned they would like to house fish more from this uh, species. Then the only requirement at this stage is to uh, provide as a license condition to provide data on um, harvest and uh, export of uh, this fishery they have been licensed to uh, fish. So that's something that NFA is looking at. That's in addition to uh, ceasing the issue of uh, show-based license to new applicants who apply for uh, fish mount since uh, 2021. So on top of that, uh, we, uh, under this Etsy project, we are implementing, uh, we have developed a focused artisanal fishery management plan. The focus is the region that's uh, the coastal uh, villages of the South Fly district. So we've developed a plan to try to uh, work with the communities to manage artisanal fishery. And one of the, the big uh, fishery issues uh, under the, the plan we're trying to manage is the fish maw. Because at, at this stage in Western province, fish maw is uh, har harvested and traded at a small scale, artisanal uh, fishery scale. So we are looking at uh, using some existing uh, uh, measures that are already in place. For example, we have management plan for baramani that restricts uh, gill nets uh, mesh size more than six inches. So uh, fish must be uh, harvested being similar species. We are trying to work with the communities to uh, enforce those regulations at a community level. You know, trying to enforce regulations from the national level uh, to get compliance at a community level is usually difficult. So we're trying to adopt some of those uh, national regulations into this uh, artisanal fishery management plan and try to help compliance at that level to see if, if it can assist in the interim of fish farm. And some uh, data measures we are trying to uh, put in this plan, uh, additional, uh, it's a community-based management plan. Additional fishery management plan is look at some customary practices that are already being uh, done in those uh, villages or other contemporary practices, so best practices they're already doing themselves. For example, some villages uh, we have surveyed, have uh, said, because they, they realize the need for managing these resources themselves, some have banned gill nets and uh, only encouraging people to use hook and line to fish. So we're trying to look at uh, practices like that and adopt and formalize into this plan so that we can uh, help work with the communities by implementing this plan. Of course, there are challenges that you know we'll, we we know we'll face when we try to uh, take some actions to manage this fishery. The first uh, is uh, multi-species. The nature of this fishery is multi-species, as you know. So it's going to be challenging and will require a lot of data and work that we need to put before we can start to come up with some managing measures um, for the fish mall fishery. And especially in, uh, in South Florida, there's a lot of uh, black market and unregulated trade, as I mentioned, uh, going across the border. So that's gonna be a challenge as well that we need to address. And most of the harvesting of fish mall happens at a village level where uh, villages have uh, tenure rights so villages villages have uh, rights to fish, and we have to just work with them because uh, government is going to have a challenging role to try to uh, impose rules on them because they have the ownership rights. So, so some challenges that 
we we know will uh, in Canada is to try to work with the communities to uh, help manage these fisheries. Think, uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone. And that's all for me. And if any questions, comments, I'm happy to answer. Well, thanks, Ken. That was um, really great, to, uh, particularly the management side and getting people together to um, work on fisheries management on the ground level. I mean, it's um, I think that's where the rubber hits the road. So it's really great to hear of that experience and work that's being done. Um, can I open up for um, questions, please? Um, so there was a question from uh, Ning Chow asking what's listed earlier, um, Kenneth, um, which one has the most valuable more? Uh, the, from, our, from our data, it's the scaling. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, and I see Michael um, Grant has his hand up to ask a question. So please go ahead, Michael. Okay, that's working. Um, yeah, really great presentation, Kenneth. I have uh, good memories of visiting Ture Ture and our uh, old Mulatto villages along that uh, South Fly coast there. Um, and I understand it's a really complex cultural um, context you're dealing there with the forest trade, trade treaty and things. Um, so it's really good work. I, my questions, um, I'm just wondering in Daru, have you seen, how, how many, I guess, commercial buyers of fish more um, do you think are currently? Through? I, I recall when I was there in 20, 2018, I think it was, um, there was a guy, Peter and Joseph, I think were the two main ones. I'm, I'm just wondering if you see much on the ground expansion in people buying at a commercial level. I think there are three or four major companies that are buying, but there are plenty of others who are going around and buying as well. So it's hard to, hard to Tell at this stage, but the major ones are the ones that they have establishments that we will sell. Yeah. 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 Okay. And just just a very quick follow up question. Um, I'm I'm not sure if you caught my talk yesterday regarding the Gulf Province, but um, what what we see in the Gulf Province is the commercial buyers are East Asian expatriates um, that largely appear to be Chinese nationality. Um, and my recollection from Daru was that there were, I think there were two Filipino buyers at the time. Um, so I'm just wondering if the, which may explain the the big disparity, I guess, in prices that we see between the two provinces. Um, I'm just wondering if you have any comment, I guess, you know, on, the, on those commercial buyers you've seen, um, are they expatriate owned businesses? Um, and is there any indication on the, nationality of those um, commercial operators that might, I guess, offer some insight into the, the trade routes that may be available to them um, exporting out of PNG. The three main established ones, uh, two expatriates and one local company. So the expatriate ones are Vietnamese and one, the other one is Chinese. Right. Okay. All right. Thanks very much, Kenneth. That was really good. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Michael. Um, thanks, Kenneth. If nobody else has any further quick questions, then we will move on. Um, it's difficult for me to see whether people have got their hands up at times. So, um, Okay, our next presentation is a pre-record. Um, it's from Professor Michael Fabini, who is from the University of Technology in Sydney. And Michael's been studying um, you know, the, uh, the, a variety of sort of high value foods in Asia. And um, so his presentation, um, which I think Nadia has just loaded up um, for, for Michael to, to um, pass on to us. 
Hi, my name is Michael Kivini from the University of Technology, Sydney. Uh, I'm sorry I'm not able to participate in the workshop, but I hope you've been having a productive few days. And uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to present. I'm going to be talking about the general problem or general challenge of high value fisheries in low income contexts. Uh, I'm not an expert in fish more fisheries, and so I'll keep my discussion fairly general. And I will draw uh, largely on my expertise in East Asian dried seafood markets, uh, in particular in China, uh, and on small scale fishery livelihoods in various parts of Southeast Asia and Pacific. I'll talk briefly now about some of the conceptual approaches that have been used to discuss these issues. So first, uh, the idea of roving bandits uh, was proposed by uh, Fikret Berkies and uh, colleagues where they talked about how markets for fisheries uh, and marine resources essentially moved so quickly uh, that institutions for sustainability uh, are not able to keep up. And so you get these recurrent patterns of, of boom and bust and, and overfishing and stock collapses. Mm -hmm. And so as a response to this, uh, Helen Scales, Yvonne Sadovi and others uh, use this example of the live reef uh, fish for food trade, uh, showing how it progressively expanded from uh, the 1970s through to the 1990s and 2000s um, from Hong Kong through uh, the broader region. And then there's the example of uh, contagious exploitation uh, used by Hampus Ericsson and others, where they show how the sourcing network for sea cucumbers in Hong Kong expanded very rapidly over just 15 years from 1996 to 2011. Uh, the number of the countries supplying sea cucumbers to Hong Kong uh, increased from 35 uh, to 83. And then there's uh, the approach of ecologically unequal exchange, uh, which essentially involves the, um, the process where high value ecological resources are exported out of resource frontiers uh, for consumption in, in higher income countries. Uh, and the producer countries bear the ecological costs. So this is an example of uh, the southern Philippines where um, you've got high value um, fisheries such as shark fin and library food fish uh, all exported out of the area, but uh, leaving significant ecological costs uh, behind. So in general, very widespread overfishing, uh, also specifically with the library food fish trade, uh, that particular fish, for example, was um, small and, uh, and caught with cyanide. And these were characteristic features of, of these fisheries in that area. So East Asia and uh, China are not the only markets for, for high value fisheries by any means, but uh, they are a significant one, and they are a particularly significant one for a range of forms of dried seafood, uh, including fish more, but also other products such as sea cucumbers, uh, shark fin, and so on. And what you've seen in China is since the early 1980s and continuing on since then, uh, we've seen a, a rapid increase in consumption and demand for all sorts of products, including various forms of marine resources specifically for some of these dried seafood products and uh, the prices of these dried seafood products um, a lot of them have continued to basically increase rapidly uh, ever since then in an ongoing way there are a range of various uh, drivers of this demand so uh, partly uh, to do with the role of the banquet uh, in contemporary China, where one of the key objectives is to, to generate face and show honour uh, to your guests by serving them high status, high, um, high end foods. Um, there are a range of perceived health benefits um, associated with various types of these high value uh, dried seafood products, such as uh, sea cucumbers in particular, that are perceived to be associated with a range of, of health benefits. 
Um, we've seen the expansion of uh, southern Chinese cuisine throughout the country so that many of these high-end um, seafood products would have only been found in, in southern parts of China, um, but now they've expanded uh, through through major cities throughout the country, so um, collectively increasing demand uh, across China. In a range of jurisdictions, such as EU, uh, the US and Japan, we've seen the introduction of various trade measures for environmental sustainability purposes. So notably uh, the EU's trade measures uh, to try and address uh, IUU fishing. Um, in China, uh, I think overall, we've seen limited attention to uh, governance of demand uh, from an environmental sustainability perspective. Uh, when trade measures have been introduced, they've more traditionally been focused on food safety concerns. So, for example, uh, recently we've seen a range of import measures imposed on uh, seafood for COVID-19 uh, and also to do with um, various geopolitical tensions, of course. I think it's fair to say that uh, market-based labelling systems such as Marine Stewardship Council and the like are not particularly well established amongst uh, consumers uh, within China, uh, but we have seen a, a significant and growing effort by various civil society organisations around consumer awareness campaigns, um, and there has been strong engagement um, around uh, shark fin and in Hong Kong in particular. But uh, I think overall, uh, the point remains that uh, at the, the demand consumer side end uh, within China, there's, there's limited uh, governance from environmental sustainability perspectives. Shifting focus now to uh, the source countries uh, where much of this seafood uh, is produced and sourced from. Um, there's the key challenge that coastal livelihoods um, in, in many parts of, of the Asia Pacific in general face very high levels of vulnerability and uh, insecurity. Uh, typically, uh, livelihoods will be um, based around uh, a range of different income generating activities. And so what this means for fishing is that Fishing can be a range of um, practices. It can be full-time, it can be seasonal, uh, it can be part-time, it can vary within households. And uh, typically you see a very high degree of occupational multiplicity where fishers may, uh, for example, move in and out of different fisheries um, over time. Uh, and move in and out of fisheries and farming or other income generating activities uh, over time. And so fishers often demonstrate very high levels of uh, flexibility and adaptability uh, in order to, to sustain a secure livelihood. And so what this means as a result uh, is that fishers' interests are not necessarily uh, directly tied uh, to the fishery. And so I'm using the term fishers, and that's a, in reality a, a real bit of a simplification because coastal livelihoods are typically um, involve much more than direct reliance on, on just a fishery. Uh, and as a result, the interests are not always directly tied uh, to the environmental sustainability of, of the fishery. So in terms of what this means for um, the operations of fisheries in particular, uh, typically we tend to see fishers uh, catching multiple high value species uh, that are essentially opportunistically targeted. Uh, so fishers will go out and on a fishing trip or on a gleaning expedition, uh, essentially catch uh, whatever they can find opportunistically. Um, and so it's very different to the sorts of uh, classic single species fisheries that you would get in, in more industrialised contexts, for, for example. Uh, a lot of these uh, fisheries uh, for dried seafood uh, are obviously more shelf stable, and so that increases the accessibility uh, for fishers to get involved in these sorts of fisheries because a lot of these um, Fisheries are taking place in 
in more remote contexts where ice and perishability uh, can be um, key factors. So we've seen uh, in many of these fisheries very high levels of pressure that essentially responds very quickly to market demand. And so in a range of fisheries where we've seen overfishing and uh, stock collapses take place, uh, we've seen shifts from high value uh, and low volume fisheries to low value uh, and high volume fisheries. And as a result, um, a shifts from uh, fewer uh, high, high value species to a range of different species that uh, are increasing in value. So this is just an example of this process in terms of shifts over time. Uh, in the southern Philippines. So um, in the 1970s, uh, fishing for sea cucumber was done uh, close to shore for only a couple of species of, of high value products of sea cucumbers. Uh, in the 1980s, the use of compressors and air diving began to be used. 1990s, greater use of technology such as depth sounders, deeper diving, and the range of species uh, increased. Uh, 2000s, um, by this time, um, you're getting smaller sizes of, of sea cucumbers, uh, such as those you can see on the right there, uh, and very high volumes as, as overfishing continued to progress. Uh, and by the 2010s, basically, uh, sea cucumber fisheries were, were largely uh, becoming exhausted in, in this part of the Philippines, and people began to shift to uh, an alternate form of uh, high value fishery, um, the live reef uh, fish and food trade. In terms of governance uh, of these fisheries in, in Southeast Asia uh, and the Pacific, again, uh, I'm making uh, very general comments here. There are lots of variations, obviously, uh, across the region, uh, but uh, in general, in many parts of uh, Southeast Asia and the Pacific, uh, there's relatively low levels of uh, government capacity to, to manage and uh, effectively govern these fisheries. Um, essentially, it can come down to a lot of the time to very limited resources, uh, financial and other uh, for enforcement. So all the sorts of things such as patrol boats, um, data collection, monitoring, licensing, registration and so on. Uh, all of that, there's just very limited uh, resources. Local governments in the area, for example, uh, fisheries management and coastal resource management tends not to be the, um, the primary priority. Uh, and so uh, coastal resources um, tends to get uh, low budgets um, for these sorts of things. Um, there's significant gaps between policy and practice uh, in, in Many countries, for example, there's very um, progressive laws or legislation and policies and so on, uh, but um, limited effects on the ground. So you see very significant gaps between what is supposed to be uh, the case and what is actually happening on the ground. And so partly this is simply due to um, the nature of small scale fisheries throughout the region. They present particular challenges um, in that they're very, very difficult to, to monitor and regulate, um, partly for the reasons I mentioned in the previous slides, where the fisheries themselves are, are so flexible and adaptable and changing that it's very difficult to effectively monitor and even accurately assess uh, what is going on. And then there's just the, the physical and geographical challenges that many of these small scale fisheries operate in, in very remote uh, and, and dispersed locations. So in summing up, uh, in this talk, I've tried to outline uh, some of the key features of the so-called wicked problem of insecure livelihoods and insufficient governance capacity, which is common uh, to a lot of these high value fisheries in low income contexts. Uh, in terms of uh, thinking about how to improve governance for better social and ecological outcomes, uh, I don't think there's any uh, sort of silver bullet or one size fits all governance solution uh, for these sorts of fisheries. But I do think there are a range of different sorts of approaches from a variety of perspectives that 
collectively can offer a range of opportunities to uh, improve governance. Uh, in source countries, uh, a lot of people and, and some governments have advocated the idea of targeting pinch points as being more feasible. So instead of trying to regulate the highly dispersed, uh, highly remote small scale fisheries throughout the region, the idea is to focus attention and resources on particular uh, marketplaces, for example, or trade hubs such as uh, capital cities, uh, provincial centres and so on, uh, where the marine products get, get funneled through. Um, I'd also note that despite um, I noted how the, there are challenges in government capacity throughout the region, uh, there are certain strengths of, of a lot of local governments. So, for example, in some countries, you do have a very highly educated and, and competent uh, workforce that uh, in some cases just can be um, strengthened significantly with some additional resources. Uh, internationally, uh, CITES uh, is becoming increasingly prominent. Uh, it's increasingly adopted for marine species, uh, such as some of these forms of dried seafood, such as uh, shark fin and sea cucumber recently, for example. Uh, and so it will be very interesting to see uh, the effects of this um, in the coming years. Uh, I mentioned earlier, various governments have been introducing uh, sustainability related trade measures, such as the EU, um, IUU trade measures. Um, it'll be interesting to see if other governments uh, start to, to use this um, these forms of trade measures, and um, they have certainly been shown to be pretty influential in influencing demand. Uh, and then uh, I'd like to note finally that civil society, um, the work of environmental NGOs and, and other uh, aspects of civil society is definitely gaining increasing traction in relation to seafood sustainability, I think. Uh, it's increasingly playing a major role in increasing public awareness uh, and in influencing policy. Uh, so with that, I'd like to finish up and uh, thank you very much. Well, it was a very uh, um, informative presentation from, from Michael, overlap and interaction between um, the trade in, in Fishmore and other high value species throughout throughout the region um also um, he mentioned the, the insecure livelihoods and the um and also the the, the um, capacity from a, a governance perspective i think these are themes which seem to be fairly common um across the um the, the presentation so far um, we might move on to Tony's presentation as our last one for the the session. I don't know what time it is where you are, Tony, but you may have the record for being up at the craziest time of the evening. So welcome aboard and happy to hand over to you. Hello, my name is Tony Nalovic. I'm uh, recording this from Cartagena, Colombia, where there is the International Sea Turtle Symposium that I'm attending, but I wanted to participate and present the situation in French Guiana. So the title is called the presentation, Drawing the Legal Foreign Fleets into Previously Preserved European Waters, the French Guiana Experience. So I work for the Regional Fisheries Committee in French Guiana, and I'm a research fisheries biologist. So French Guiana is uh, located in uh, Latin America, South America, in the northeast portion um, of the continent, <clears throat> and it's the only continental European uh, territory, a department of France. It is part of the Guiana Shield and is considered to be a biodiversity hotspot. We have a border with Suriname and a border with Brazil, which is actually the longest French border um, would be French Guiana's border with Brazil. <clears throat> and it's 90% uh, forests uh, with an EZ that covers over 120,000 square miles. So concerning the marine habitat, 
Uh, here you have a um, satellite image of the um, chlorophyll where you can see that the outflow coming from Brazil uh, of the Amazon is influenced by the North Brazilian current and goes along the coast. So you have almost a homogeneous uh, marine habitat uh, between Northern Brazil all the way to Venezuela uh, with very murky waters along the coast, an area very rich for species biodiversity including cyanids. So the economic uh, situation in French Guiana, um, as a department overseas of France, we have a very high unemployment rate. Uh, we can see that in gray, it's people who are not working with different categories from men to women, uh, people of different age classes and young people, especially from 15 to 29, people are not active. The yellow is people who are on welfare, and the blue is the people who are working. So very uh, country where people need to have an employment. <clears throat> and in French Guiana, we have three different fishing sectors. We have artisanal gill netting, uh, coastal whitefish uh, targeting the fishing sector, which we'll be talking about mostly uh, concerning the cyanids. We have uh, Venezuelan hand liners. Uh, who are fishing with uh, artisanal hand lines and semi-industrial shrimp trawler boats. So white fish is the main protein that is produced on the territory and consumed locally. And <clears throat> with the minimized fishing effort in French Guiana, because we have rules and regulations, and more recently with the COVID crisis, we've had a lot of crises and a lot of boats are staying at the dock. Uh, for the reason that a lot of the workers in the industry are of origin of Suriname and Guyana or Brazil, and it's been very hard for them to get the papers since the COVID. Also, <clears throat> in French again, it's known for practicing sustainable fisheries. Uh, we talk about bycatch reduction for shrimp trawls in the non-fishing zones. The handliners from these Venezuelan boats are very selective. And for example, in coastal fisheries, we have voluntary non-fishing zones. Uh, practiced by the fishermen for emblematic species like marine turtles when they come around. So what's the issue here? So um, we can see that these different countries have similar fleets, but however, they don't have the same number of boats. So if we start up in Guyana, for example, with the 135 shrimp boats that were around in 2012, um, these boats didn't have regulations for preventing them from trawling too, co too close to the coast. And so they impeded on this zone, which we consider in French Guiana to be nursery grounds uh, and where we do not trawl. We don't trawl in less than 30 meters of water depth. And this puts uh, pressure on the coastal fisheries who report their fishing effort into Suriname. Suriname has the same problem with the shrimp boats. And so all of the boats find themselves short of resources and therefore going into French Guiana to target resources. This is historical over 20 years. So if we focus uh, on the IUU coastal fisheries from other countries, we can see, for example, this one boat was captured from the Brazilian side with 18 kilometers of net on a single boat. So if you have 30 boats, that's a lot of net, just enough to cover the entire coastline of French Guiana. And so IUU fishing uh, is considered to, especially in the coastal habitat, is considered to represent at least two to three times the fishing effort from the local boats. Um, the boats are coming from Brazil, from Suriname, from Guyana. And on the offshore segments, uh, which is, you know, pelagic fisheries, uh, there are no French Guyana boats. We can't get authorizations to go explore those resources, yet we've captured boats from Panama, Taiwan, uh, China, Brazil, Venezuela, and Trinidad. Some boats have been seen and not seen, but these are the boats that have been at least seen in French Guiana waters fishing with long lines. <clears throat> so when WWF decided uh, to conduct some flyovers uh, over French Guiana, so this is the uh, portion that's close to Suriname, the blue would be the uh, vertebrate animals and you know, sharks and rays and turtles the green would be the french guyanese boats and the red would be the illegal boats with their nets deployed so basically the zone is invaded by other boats and uh when they did the same flyover in 2022 
um, to be a little bit more explicit, um, you can see where the animals, the blue vertebrates, so sharks, rays, and dolphins and such are tend to be inside of French Guiana and away from the illegal boats. You see a few green dots. These are the French boats. And then you see all these red dots are all the foreign vessels. So I think that's 29 of them in this count. Anyway, if you were to um, put them in equivalent, so if you look on this uh, scale of, of distance, so the, the blue segment will represent five kilometers of net. So if you were to apply five kilometers net to each one of these boats, seeing that these boats use at least five kilometers of net, sometimes up till seven, um, you can see the walls of net that are fishing in French Guiana at any time. If you were to align <clears throat> these nets uh, linearly, you can see that uh, it represents basically on a single day, 120 kilometers of gill net being deployed in comparison to the French Guiana boats who have a strict limit of 2.5 kilometers uh, with 12.5 uh, kilometers. So basically they're fishing on any one side 10 times as much as us. We even had um, NGOs such as Bloom um, uh, concerned about the situation and request and you know do, do the petitions that they do and articles. Uh, they even wrote with WWF and the French Guiana Fisheries Committee to President um, Macron a few years ago, 2017, to request that they lead on the situation with illegal fisheries in French Guiana. The fishermen obviously uh, have reclamations and they want operation pl operational plans to reduce the fishing, the illegal fishing effort. You can see that between 2002 and 2011, there's this very large increase in the number of illegal boats that are seen in French Guiana. And that the uh, compare when you compare the legal boats, which are stable, the number of days at sea or the production in tons, the numbers of kilograms produced by these illegal boats well, rises substantially. Uh, this study hasn't been updated since 2012, but I'll come back to that a little bit later. Also, uh, so if we're now getting into the cyanids, we can look at the Sinocion na Cupa. So the Abascada Amarela, as it would be called in Brazil, or the Bang Bang, as it would be called in Guyana and Suriname, and the Acupa Rouge, as it would be called in French Guyana. The last assessment, red list assessment, was conducted in 2021. And so in French Guyana, the overseas department of France, located between Suriname and Brazil, there are strict limits on fishing licenses, gillnet lengths, and the mesh sizes. However, due to high levels of continuously increasing illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing by boats originating from Brazil, Suriname, and Guyana, overfishing is uh, occurring in French Guiana. Due in part to a lack of anticipated changes in the management to discourage illegal fishing, reduce the fishing effort, or to practice sustainable fishing practices at a regional scale, the decline is expected to continue into the future over the next generation length. So what does that look like? Well, we went from threatened uh, before this assessment vulnerable. And so we believe that the next stage will be endangered. Uh, this has substantial consequences for French Guiana, the Department of France. How do we catch the other fish if we can't catch this fish? <clears throat> so what's the impact of um, this activity on the other animals? So for example, um, if we look at Sotalia guianensis in the same time, 10 year time period, we're looking at an over 50% decrease in observation of these animals. So it's kind of looking like little Sotalia will become the next vaquita, little estuary and dolphin. Sorry about that. So the uh, the leatherback is also substantially decreases in the last couple of years. We're having uh, less than 100 nests per year. Um, so the leatherback population is also crashing. Uh, in French Guiana, uh, on the east side, uh, where these boats with all those dots in the Suriname side uh, are located. 
So we're very concerned about this. Also, if we look at um, saltfish in French Guiana, we did a, conducted an assessment in Guyana, French Guiana and Suriname. And we can see that fishermen that fished for over 40 years all have seen leatherbacks and had not, not, not seen any. But fishermen that started fishing um, more recently, so between 2010 and 2017, 92% of them had never seen a leatherback. So you can see how this uh, increases in fishing effort and peating on the it's, French it's, it's one of those scams. Just leave it. It's species. To a point where all the members of the French Marine Turtle Action Plan, uh, whether they're local or uh, international, um, wide cast, uh, the IUCN Marine Turtle Specialist Group, the even the Cyanid Specialist Group, the fisheries committees, WWF, scientific research institutes and NGOs, and the French government have all signed a motion, a uh, resolution uh, concerning the problematic of illegal fishing in French Guiana and have sent it uh, since October, 4th of October, 2022. Here's a little link. If you wanted to download it, there's a version that's in English. If you wanted to appreciate that. So now talking about the illegal fishing fish bladder market, um, which they call glue in Guyana or gruge in Brazil and visti in French. So it is a legal market in French Guyana, but there's a lot of informal trafficking in place where the bladder that are caught in French Guyana are sold towards Suriname and Brazil. So the price sold from the fishermen to the intermediary. So the middleman is 150 euros per kilogram wet. And we have uh, some discrepancies in the evaluations of the, the product once dried uh, in Hong Kong, but we've seen evidence of numbers ranging from 2,000 US dollars per kilogram to $18,000 per kilogram. <laughs> so <clears throat> it's considered by, so the source data was the uh, Hong Kong customs data. Uh, and a colleague, future colleague of ours in French Guiana, her name is CU, and she uh, crunched these numbers and evaluated that the bladders that are coming from uh, the Sinocion Nacupa for Brazil, Suriname, and Guyana is equivalent to uh, 100, 100 million, basically, euros per year. And the volume exported by these three countries represents 24% of the swim bladder market entering Hong Kong. But at this stage, we don't have enough information to evaluate what is precisely the volume of bladders that are exiting French Guiana. So fish small trafficking is a major driver of value new fisheries and the depletion of French Guiana's marine resources. So what's our strategy? So we have a strategy is uh, to improve the efficiency of the methods we do have to fight IUU fishing. So in French Guiana, there's a number of boats, there's a number of Marines, but just how do you, do you use them to be effective fighting illegal fisheries? And so what we prone would be a continuous presence on the coast, on the uh, front, frontiers of French Guiana, whether it would be on the Brazilian side, on the Surinamese side, with light boats that can enter the creeks and the rivers where the Brazilian boats and Surinamese boats sometimes go to hide. Um, and then we also want to do an opportunity analysis because since the industry in French Guiana is largely suffering, uh, if we could develop a market or instead of having to sell the bladders at 150 euros a kilo and find out that they're being sold for 20, 30, 40 times that price on the export market, maybe French Guiana, who's a European nation and has these norms, we could labelize these bladders and send them directly to high-end markets in Hong Kong, hotels, et cetera, to maybe get some benefits, benefits to the local fisheries and actually increase their fishing effort uh, with their smaller nets and occupy the marine habitat, preventing other boats from coming in. Because the opportunity, which would consist of just reducing our fishing effort, would have no conservation impact, seeing that that space is where our boats are would automatically be replaced by foreign boats with much, much longer nets. 
<clears throat> and so uh, we want to develop uh, the legal supply chain and get higher returns. And so continuation of the strategy, the CRPM, French Guiana Regional Fisheries Committee, uh, will start an internship in January 2023 uh, to help us answer some of the questions uh, in a partnership with IFREMER, so the French Marine Research Institute for the Exploitation of the Sea, the WWF, the University of French Guiana, and the University of Brussels. And so this internship should start in 2023. Currently, uh, we're conducting, um, we're collecting data uh, on bladder sizes to compare them with uh, you know, full-sized fish uh, by sex. So what would be the, um, the size relationship between bladders and size of the fish um, in French Guiana? We don't have this element and it seems very important. And uh, in March 2000, uh, by the end of this month, beginning of April, we will be starting a new study in French Guiana to evaluate the fishing effort by foreign fleets. So the data is coming from uh, the French Navy flyovers over the past couple of years from previous years and information coming from boats that are seized by the Marines. And we also have a, we're gonna program flyover studies from the WWF French Guiana more substantially. I want to thank the organizers for the opportunity of setting up this workshop. Uh, it's very important for us in French Guiana to get the word out on the situation that we're facing. Uh, some of you may recall that there was a motion proposed at the last IUCN meeting in Marseille, France, uh, concerning the importance and the problems concerning the, bla the, bla uh, the mall bladder market. So uh, if there's any questions that anybody has, uh, don't hesitate to get in touch with me. There's gonna be more information to come, um, but we're, we're mobilized on the subject. Thank you very much and uh, have a good, uh, have a good, uh, what would be, good day, good day. It's gonna be 4 a.m. in the morning for me when normally I'm supposed to talk. I will try to wake up but uh, I preferred to do this recording to make sure I did, was able to provide something. Thank you. Well, thanks, Tony. Um, I can see you there. It's um, what, after four in the morning. So um, does anybody have any quick questions for, for Tony? That was um, certainly interesting to hear from from that part of the world and certainly um yeah the eastern side of south america seems to be a big source of more um for for hong kong in particular so um tony are you, are you there <clears throat> um th does anybody have any quick questions um for tony that we could either we could put them in the chat area, which he could pick up if possible. Um, Kim. I don't know if Tony can hear, but I just wonder if, uh, what's the conversation like there for international controls, uh, similar to as discussed by, uh, by Michael and others about using international trade controls. Do you think the most of the trades going in under the under the counter, or do you think there's opportunities for that to be valuable for for that for that region? Thanks. Yeah, it may also be that Tony's got internet connection problems. Um, he was a little bit um, disconnected earlier, so um, we might have to take that one on on notice, Kim. Um, uh, Tony, I don't know whether you're able to see the chat area, but there is a um, a question from Ling Chao um, about collaborative efforts over the the management of that that species which you've been talking about. Um, is there anything which is happening across the borders? And again, you might just want to um, put an answer in the chat area.
Okay. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, we, we've got about 15 or 20 minutes um, for some broader discussions. Um, the, the, there are some sort of re, um, recurring themes and some um, common themes um, across a lot of the presentations. Um, information scarcity manifests itself in a whole range of ways, just poor information on the um, on the on the fisheries, on, on the trade, you know, secrecy in the trade. Um, there do seem to be some opportunities for uh, new new techniques. Um, I think Kim mentioned um, lots of new techniques potentially available to to track um, fish moors and also the the, the fishing activities. Um, there's still a big question about how trade and and controls on demand can be um, um, a, a, a workable tool. There's certainly plenty of examples where um, where focused campaigns on the demand side have had some benefit, but we've also seen how they have shifted um, the um, the fishing activities into other areas. And 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 Michael's um, presentation spoke about just how quickly um, fishing effort can can shift and grow um, in some of his examples. Um, one of the areas that I thought, and, and there seems to be some unanimity of views between between those who um, work on the fisheries management or the and the um, improved um, management capacity in fisheries agencies. And so I'm wondering whether that's an area where there could be some um, you know, joint discussions and joint communiques. It's quite disturbing that SDG 14 is very lowly funded. Um, and I'm wondering whether there needs to be a lot more effort put into ensuring that um, fisheries management agencies have the capacity to put in place you know, fishery management plans, engage people, enforce the the um, the, the, the laws. Um, the last thing which came out to me was this um, issue of you know at the root cause is is poverty, and it's always tempting for for fishers who have access to something that might be worth you know tens or hundreds or tens of thousands of dollars a kilo. It's pretty difficult to to say no to that sort of benefit. Um, I mean, it, given the time that we've got, is there a particular topic area that people can't do everything? Um, happy to take some suggestions as to um, a topic area that might be of interest. Kim, are you looking for an award for the most questions tonight? No, mate, you don't have to choose me, but I'm going to put my hand up because I'm interested to talk, but it's I'm happy to go last. No, no, it's okay. Let's. Um, um, I'm happy to take um, you know, to start the ball rolling, um, and hopefully other people will pile in with some um, either additional views or some new ideas. Um, as I said, we don't have much time, but let's let's start. Um, sure, go for it, Kim. Yeah, no one's talking, so I'm coming in. Um, I just find it so Im important for us to to elevate the story of what's happening here. And I think I've experienced the ability to tell a story as being just as important as the facts in mobilizing change that we all wanna see. And I've noticed there's probably about 40 people on this list that's coming to this event day in, day out. I just wonder if someone like ADM Capital would be interested in running maybe a list server or some type of ability for us to share information, at least around this small group or anyone else who wants to join. For instance, in Michael Fabini's talk, he put down you know, a range of really great reading. A lot of research in there went into that kind of discussion. Making those papers available, making some type of understanding if a new paper comes up, we could share it around the group as we go forward. If there's a proposal being written, can anyone add to that proposal or bring their country alongside it or their institution? So we build up the story 
of Fishmore. So people who don't know what Fishmore is begin to understand what it is, but then further than that, begin to also visualize the solutions alongside the community who's very interested in it. And we just need to tell this story better and we need to find the people who are willing to make a difference and make sure we don't lose touch of each other because we're all underwater on our jobs. And if ADM Capital or anyone else wants to take the lead in helping that community stick together and push that progress forward, I think that would be a wonderful uh, initiative. Thank you. Well, that um, certainly seems to be um, a need for information exchange. Um, definitely, um, there may be um, organisations that are interested in in participating in funding. Um, so, yeah, definitely, I've, I've, I've written a note about that as an idea. And Duncan, just thank you to yourself and, and your company, Fish Matter, I don't know if it's a consultancy, whatever, for putting this all together and bringing everyone around the table. Thank you. I think, thanks, Kim. It, it was my, it, it was the stories about, or the information about the sawfish that got me concerned. I think I said yesterday, they're pretty cool animals. And um, so, yeah, I, but I'm now I'm even more, um, amazed at what else is is at risk as a result of, of what's happening so um anyway we've had a really broad um range of presentations I, i'd like to think that we've improved the knowledge it was one of the um the, the goals that the steering committee put forward was you know doing an update um and then also uh, improving um the, the state of knowledge i don't know whether yvonne or Simone, I think Jeff's already gone, um, but Yvonne or Simone, whether you've got any comments on whether um, we've really advanced the, um, my feeling is I think we've advanced the, 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 the knowledge quite a lot. So, um, but if you've got any comments, that would be great. Uh, Duncan? Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, I, just very briefly, because there's only a small amount of time left, I think, the really fantastic uh, talks and range of talks, as you said, and this is a very complex issue, even more than many many other fisheries, I think, or similar to the most difficult ones. So the, one of the things I think that, t uh, that uh, Kim highlighted is awareness. I mean, we started working on it about 10 years ago and very few people were actually aware that this trade existed and in places where it was known, uh, the the more was just considered as trash and it wasn't recorded. There was a lot of secretiveness around the trade um, from the traders generally. So the awareness, I think, is incredibly important and awareness of the value and ways in which more value could maybe taken back to communities, which may or may not be an incentive to manage. But I think communities benefiting is clearly important. And of course, the other thing that pretty much everyone has spoken about is implications um, for certain species um, are pretty dire, both from direct targeting, um, croakers and catfish, and also for indirect targeting of, of some of the, the big the megafauna. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of areas that are very hidden to our data collection systems and documentation um, and opportunities to learn more about those now people know. And also maybe it would be great to see, you know, a trade category introduced in countries exporting some of this more so that we can really get a handle on the extent of trade. So provenance, destinations, volumes, uh, these kinds of things. So those are the probably the things that's floated to the surface for me. Thank you for the opportunity and, and thank you to everybody um, for really great talks. Thanks, Duncan, to you for leading this too. Thanks, Yvonne. Um, Michael? Um, I see you've got your hand up. Yeah, I, I think um, Kim and Yvonne have possibly beaten me to what I was going to say. But um, yeah, I, I, I was just sort of going to suggest like, you know, having everyone come together and present, you know, quite similar stories, but also differences in these global regions, whether... Whether there's a feeling, I guess, that the international fishing community recognises the scale of fish more, um, 
and whether there's scope to think about, I guess, some sort of high profile publication to sort of really put fish more on the map, um, that possibly that that could be a useful exercise, maybe a bit of a nightmare to write, um, but nonetheless. And the second point, um, which is possibly a question for Kim, um, in terms of I, I think a common theme here is that it would be really useful um, looking into the, the development of a Fishmore commodity code in some of these international databases just to help with the overall transparency of, of the international trade. Um, how, like how does that work? What, what's the process in terms of, um, you know, putting that idea forward and trying to get some action on it? I can speak to that if you want, Duncan. Yeah, please do. All right, so the, the customs codes are basically finished. We, we're not going to be offered a custom code for more. So what needs to potentially happen is for groups like ourselves to present the idea of a custom codes that regions and countries could take up as an additional number of units of, of numbers behind the custom code that's common for grouped um, species that they might be able to add to their records so that therefore we can use that as a common denominator to look at data through time if we could get down to national records. We did manage to get some shark fin done, but uh, it's a massive uphill sl slog and they still use the traditional metric numbers, which, you know, don't reflect a modern day approach to, to understanding things from the perspective of, of codes. I mean, we've now presently got people in Indonesia monitoring individual tuna all the way from small scale fisheries to European markets. And uh, yet customs codes are, you know, topped out and we can't get new ones for, for potential species groups or commodity groups that we want. So there is, there is a way to do it, but we have to work underneath the more slow moving customs, uh, international customs controls to encourage countries and regions to start adopting a common number that we could all potentially mine later. But then, you know, as Duncan's pointed out, and as Michael's pointed out himself, lots of this is happening outside of um, formal economy. And so there, there is all range of opportunities, these pinch point ideas of trying to get standardized packaging, standardized labeling, so that anything outside of that is immediately flagged in, in customs checks, if there's sniffer dogs or whatever identifies seafood but then also the ability to, to put labels and, and build numbers. It, we have to take a multi-pronged approach and it's, it's just not easy. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, um, Kim. I'm, I'm not gonna leave the management bit alone. I was really, um, um, I, I found Kenneth's presentation really compelling, sitting down with people um, and then making sure that people um, understand the issues and and put forward the solutions. I think that's where the rubber hits the road. Um, there was a publication by the OECD many years ago when the whole globalization of trade um, in seafood started to to ramp up, and there were one group saying, "Well, we should stop the trade in seafood because it was leading to decline." But then there was another group who said that if the fisheries were well managed, then the benefits flow to the fishermen. And I think that the, the management side of things um, really needs some extra effort, um, whether it's both in terms of funding and capacity building, and whether it's done on the ground or in the head offices of the fisheries agencies. I think um, that to me is, is a a, a really overlooked area of, of investment. So, if, if you don't mind me just, um adding, I guess, on the back of what Kim said there. And thank you very much, Kim. That was very insightful. Um, that's something I know absolutely zero about. Um, in, in terms, I guess, of, you know, where are we at with fish more globally? Um, I, I'm quite involved in freshwater sort of circles at the moment. Um, and, and they're kind of going through this freshwater biodiversity crisis. And there's been a lot of 
literature coming out on that. Um, but there's been some really useful papers that, you know, have titles like 25 key questions to mitigating freshwater biodiversity loss, et cetera. Um, and, and it could be that there's scope to sort of put together a bit of a review about what we don't know rather than what we do know. Um, and that could, that could just be something um, to generate ideas moving forward. Um, but yeah, I'll leave it at that. And yeah, thanks again, Duncan, for everything. Okay, um, I want to thank all of our um, speakers for just fascinating insights. Everything from the ground, um, incidental impacts. Um, I, it's really opened my mind up um, to you know what what this is all about, and and certainly um, been really helpful. I think to to everybody to. If we can follow up some of these ideas, Michael, about a publication, um, I'd be really keen to have that conversation with those who want to to contribute. Um, I saw a question um, in the chat area about access to people's presentations. Um, um, if anybody, we'll assume that presentations are available unless we're told otherwise, and we'll set up a, an area for people to, to access them. Um, we also will be doing um, some editing of the video so that um, the video recordings will be downloadable and available. And I also have to do a report on the workshop. Um, but there has been a suggestion about a paper uh, made by the steering committee. So anybody who's interested in that, then um, yes, that would be certainly something that needs to be done. So I just want to, um, in terms of wrapping up, I want to thank my steering committee as I said Jeff's gone it's a bit late for him um, but Yvonne Simone um, really helpful guidance and suggestions and certainly um, the contacts which you had um, helped us get more people involved than I ever imagined um, I remember talking to Liberty a week or so ago and she was talking about um, advertising and um, and promoting but we'd already back then had about 70 participants and we were still getting registrations a few hours before the first day opened up. That's obviously an area which people are really interested in. Um, also, I want to thank again our um, donors to ADM Capital Foundation. Um, I know you guys have been involved in a lot of fisheries for a long time or fisheries work. Um, community fishing um, and sorry, the Small scale community fisheries trust uh, based in the UK. Um, again, I mean these are areas which I think um, you know need to be followed up. Um, you know for, for for them in terms of how to make these fisheries sustainable for small scale fishers as well. Um, so yeah, it's getting late. Um, unless anybody's got anything to um, urgent to add, um, I'll quite happily close the meeting and thank you for your participation both as presenters and also participants. Thanks everybody. Have a good sleep, a good day, whatever. Thank you, Duncan. Thank you all. Thank you.